You can work if you want to. You can really work OBS. So please start working. Please start working. Oh, oh, OBS. You can work if you want to. You can really work so well. So please, OBS. Please, OBS. Why do you put me through this? Mm -hmm. You can work if you want to. You can really work. You can. So please, OBS. Please, OBS. Work this time for me. You can work if you want to. You can really, really work. So please, OBS, please, OBS, work for me this time. Okay, now you want me to play my mobile phone. Where's my mobile phone? Oh, frigate. Where have I put it down? Why do, you, why do you ask me to do so many checks and balances? Thank you. Thank you. You can work. Woohoo! We are working! You can work, OBS. You can really, really work. So please, OBS, please, OBS, don't you be a twerp. You can work, you can work. You can really, really work. So, hello, everyone. Hello, I'm, I'm, I'm down here. How is it the side profile camera is doing a better job of finding me at the moment than you are? You're supposed to be on human tracking. Track me! Track me! Oh, good lord, I'm in double focus. Right, and there's going to be a box here in a second. Um, first thing, before I start off too much, and oh, good lord, don't I look great in profile? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, finally arrived. Three Republics, One Navy, Naval History of France, 1870 to 1999. Anthony Clayton's book. Um... <laughs> yeah I needed it for uh, Tuesday's video so Tuesday's video is now going to get re-recorded and redone but you know good place to start and as always please as I do every single time we are we starting a live we are starting a live this is going to be a live video so, if you don't like lives, might I recommend Long Patrols? In which case, things which don't have the brew ship's title, don't have the Patreon title, are usually your key. Um, there are Long Patrols in the Patreon videos, because there are Long Patrols made from the Patreon topics. That's part of the thing. You know, they get a live video on a Thursday, and then they get a recorded video on the Saturday a week later. That's part of it. That's it. But, you know, that's all fun. Having way too much fun with us right now. So, let's go through and say hello to everyone. Hello, Team Locker. Hello. Oh, I'm supposed to be doing it. Yeah, I want timestamps. And I want moderation activity. I want both on there. It's got the timestamps on. But it's not. I... Okay. Hello, Paul Amos. Hello, Calvin Gasberg. Hello, Michael Cooch. Hello, nice to go, everyone. Hello, Mark Harkness. Hello, Tanaverka. Hello, Paul Amos. I know we said I said hello to Paul Amos. Oh, well. hello, Paul. Mega Scrow. Hello. Yeah, nice to go, everyone. I I spotted the comment. I haven't responded because. In a world in which the N3 and G3 are built, um, that's going to change the treaties enough, that's going to change the construction criteria enough, that honestly, the whole scenario, your whole metric is wrong, is thrown off. There is no, uh, you know, what class they're building by the time they get the King George V equivalent. If there, if there isn't a treaty, then that's going to be completely different, because there's three or four classes down the road. So who knows how naval battleships will evolve. One of the reasons why battleships look so similar in World War One and World War Two is because of the battleship building holiday. Because there is a building holiday. If there hadn't been a holiday, they'd have kept going and kept evolving. And who knows how they'd have looked by that time. So, yeah, in an N3, G3 built world, the King George Vs, what guns are they going to have for starters? How many guns are they going to have? What's their desired speed of operation? Are they fast battleships? Are they battle cruisers? Are they battleships? What are... That's all going to guide into the, the size and scale of the ship. There is not enough criteria to be, give you an answer. I could give you one. I could agree with you. 
but I would literally be blowing smoke at you. That's hot air. It's there's no there's no actual judgment in that at all. That's literally me just going, yeah, you're right to basically just give you an answer to a question or saying it and, and hoping you know that that's a scenario you'd be dealing with people. Anyone who's saying yeah, you're right in that scenario. Because they're basically just telling you, yeah, you're right, because they don't want to have to defend the argument of no. Because they're hoping it goes away. But the reality is, you can't answer that question. You can't. Hello, Team Locker. Hello, John Shea. Hello, The Brock. Hello, Steam Richards. Hello, DG40. Hello, Jacob. This is going to be the, this is the real Dr. Clock. Yes, there is now a copycat of me on Discord. Um, who spells it Navai history. Yeah, because it's N-A-V-A-I history. A-C Navai history instead of A-C naval history. Um, hello, Leslie. Yeah, and then there's the whole race stuff in it as well, as Leslie's pointing out. Are you sure Congress won't build a response? Because whilst you, uh, whilst I can be doubtful that Congress will build a response, I can't be sure. So that's a factor. And what the IGN, what does Italy do in response? What does uh, you know? There's all sorts of people involved. How do I said Ron Nelson? How David Goulding? And the the. The United States 831, and also the Japanese, they haven't ordered those ships yet. Those ships are planned, they're not ordered. We know what the Japanese are planning, we know what the Americans had ordered, we know what the British were building. We don't know what's the next generations after those things, and we don't know what actually turns up. Um, yeah, there was sorting out food stuff. Hello, Andrew Buffer. Hello, Byron Newman. Hello, Leslie. I'm not sure if I said that on. Um, yeah, that reminds me. <sighs> I'll sort that out. And hello, Tanif. Hello, Abelzuski. Hello, Bug Guy eighty two nine. Hello, Stephen Richards. Hello. Oh, I said hello to everyone. I think I have now. <laughs> Shivra, hello, and the Brock, and everyone else. Night six eight three one. As I was once told by a gentleman of my a friend of mine called Alan Sykes, who, if you look up, is a fairly famous economist. And I knew him because he lives. He was a neighbour not far from me. Mm, there is a difference between countries being bankrupt and being bankrupt. There is a difference in countries going bankrupt before the International Monetary Fund and various other things which would get involved and would start imposing strictures, and countries going bankrupt nowadays. So you have to be quite careful about presuming because a country is bankrupt... They won't build or do something. And Italy is built, still building battleships in the other three. Yes. So there is bankrupt and there is bankrupt. There is bankrupt and still building battleships. And there is bankrupt in not building and not building anything. And... There is also, how long do you take to finish it? And as I've been over before, there's a fact for the, the Italians, if they finish even one, they get the world's first fast battleship. And it doesn't matter about its military capabilities. It matters what it has on paper. On paper, it's a battleship. On paper, it's got armor equivalent to everyone else. Doesn't matter what, it, what the reality. It, does, it doesn't matter that there are ships out there the G3s could hammer it. It doesn't matter. What matters is it's the world's fast, first fast battleship, and that's going to change the metric of, oh, good lord, now you can make battleships go fast too? And that's going to change things, and who knows what that changes. And also, the Japanese are planning a fast battleship, so that's going to be changing things. It's just, there's, there's too much before you get to the G3s. You're, you're, you're talking about the G3s are early 1920s. 
You're talking about the best part of two decades before you get, in terms of design and development, before you get to what would be the equivalent time period to the King George V. Okay, if you want to make it short at 15 years. That's a lot of time. It takes roughly two years to build and, com build and commission a battleship in the Royal Navy. Let's say they do a new class every four, five, every five years. That's three generations of uh, capital ships designed. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's the thing. Now I am going to do questions, but I am also going to do box packing because if the camera will be kind enough to follow me. And I have moved a lot of things around to make this possible. And hence, there's such quite such a rubbish corner over here, if I do this. Um, you'll notice there is a huge pile of books here. And all these books, and all those books still need to go into boxes. So, let's see if we can box up some books while we're talking and answering questions today. And I've got the camera set up, which I'm calling the box cam. Now, I do have a small problem. If I put it at the level, the boxes will be directly, so it peers into them. It's also directly at um, level with something else, and then this becomes a very different stream. So um, it's going slightly above it, so I'm sorry it's belly level rather than anything below that. It is a weird view, am I? But no, this will be sorted out in a second, so it's going to focus onto the box. I could do that the other way around, but yeah. I, I thought it was a good idea to have a box I do for you all. I'm not sure how, whether I have enough tape here for this all, so that could well be the end of it, but you know, we'll see. So, Tim Locker, how would a modern 16 inch gun battleship look like in the Royal Navy Uniform Service? Um, depending on how much invested they prefer to go, would I either have two twin or two triple turrets forward? And it would have a missile farm about halfway along. And then it would have a hanger aft. Broadly speaking. A whole load of secondaries on it. Um, probably a whole load of 5 inch. In American terminology. Um, and a whole load of 40 millimeter and lasers. It's The interesting thing is the power supply. What do you go with? Because if you're prepared to put enough concrete. On it. And enough things like that on it, you could make a very powerful vessel but you have to be prepared to put those things on it, if that makes sense. So, yeah, how are you prepared to make it nuclear powered? Are you prepared to put the armour and things required to do so? Or, alternatively, have a nuclear reactor system which is designed to drop out the bottom of the hull and down into the depth of the ocean. If anything goes wrong, that's always an option. Most of the people who like to pretend, or at least claim to be pro the planet, would have probably not like you on that front. But it would be an option for keeping the crew alive. Um, if you go gas power, well, you're going to need to mount. You're going to need to raft the engines because gas turbines are far more fragile in many ways than, sea tur than um, steam turbines. And as a result, you're going to have to make it all sort of 
were uh, rafted to protect it from the vibrations. I think I need to raft a whole lot of technology actually. A bit to keep it protected from vibration of the guns. Because as much as you try and make the guns not vibrate, they are going to vibrate. 16 inch guns go. But that's pretty much what you'd be dealing with. It'll be all forward armament, kind of like um, Nelson, Rodney, Dunkirk's. Basically, the French style battleships are pretty really onto it. The French battleships were far easier to be made in many regards because of that, because of the all forward armament. And I also find it fun because now I, I swear if the King Daughter V's having an all forward design, there's plenty of space R for, let's say, aircraft operations. They would have been retained in service a lot longer, and probably would have outlasted Vanguard. Because of the fact that they offer the guns, but also spaces for missiles, and spaces for thing, uh, spaces for aircraft operation. You know, you can imagine the, uh, the helicopter system you could put on the back of those. Okay. Well, Stack Ryan, did you manage to eat? Um, I did manage to grab a little something. So yes, I've eaten, I've eaten something. Uh, and I, I managed to fix the food. So that was being cooked so that, um, the rest of the family can eat. Uh, question 15, that's again, without any Anglo-German naval arms race, how does the RN fare? <laughs> Well, they probably still have the largest naval uh, um, naval force in the world, but without the arms race, which started in 1890, you're going to have a strategic picture. Um, if you haven't had the arms race, or you haven't had the naval race, which started, as said, in 1890, you might well find that in World War I, Britain is not allied with France. Um, Britain will be allied against whoever's allied with Russia, and that could well be Germany, because... Let's be honest, the bigger, the reason, the only reason that the Germans outrank the Russians, the British strategic concern, is because of the Navy. If it hadn't been for the Navy, then as far as the British government would have been concerned, Germany ranked a lot lower than the threats, which was Russia, which kept aiming for India. And I know people, don't, that's not always popular. People go, no, no, Britain wouldn't have allied with Germany. Yeah, they would have, because they, they didn't like Russia. And that's the whole thing. You know, that's... Look at the original alliance Britain has. It's with Japan. Why? Because we don't like Russia. And that alliance is built on... Predicated on the fact that if Russia and, Fr if R if Russia and France team up on either of us, the other one joins in. That's pretty much the nature of the Anglo-Japanese alliance. The first, al uh, first alliance of its kind that Britain ever got involved in. That pretty much tells you everything you need to know. Oh, good lord, that's a big book. Um. <laughs> oh, that's not going to fit in. I think that's going to be interesting. These should fit in. <laughs> oh, good lord. Okay, so. Literally, fill the box. <laughs> oh. Oh. How's the dose, thankfully? Oh, caramba. Yeah, this is not going to be a light box, is it? This is going to be the box that they pick up of books and they go, What the frigate do you own, man? And I'm going to go, Um, books. Sure not lead weights? No, books. Books, definitely books. All books. I'm sure they're all books. Small possibility of lead weights, but we'll leave it mostly books. Um... Nice Aaron, uh, uh, Gooch. The Aaron Arrogant class in 1897 were designated as fleet rams. Oh, that's probably didn't come off. Um, why was the RN still commissioning rams in 1879, the era of the uh, quick firing guns and high explosives? Uh, because rams were still considered useful. 
And because whilst those other things were coming into being, rams were something you were fairly sure of. And let's be honest, the Royal Navy had managed to sink their own ships in blue on blue, mag in blue, on blue events with rams. They knew rams worked. It's kind of like, why does the torpedo bomber for most of the 1920s and 30s, in fact, for, and for a good, um, most of World War II, actually, is does it outrank the dive bomber? Because you know it works. It's that typical thing with navies. People get surprised at how conservative they are. They are truly conservative. I'm not talking about politically conservative. I'm talking about in terms of procurement. Because if they make a mistake, they can lose a war and a lot of people die and their country gets destroyed. So they are always going to edge on the side of how do we make sure, how do we be sure? So if you look at the way those ships were armed, they are rams. In fact, HMS Dreadnought's fitted with a ram. But just because they're fitted with a ram, doesn't mean, it doesn't mean they, they are only fitted with a ram. They're fitted with other weapons as well, quick firing guns, etc., to enable them to engage with those latest weapon systems, whilst also having the insurance of, well, if we need to, we can wreck their day with that. Hmm. That's basically the idea. And it works, let's be honest. It's what navies have been doing for a long time because it does work. Ah, Glyn's nine stale star. Nine stale star. Good book. Fun one to read. Uh, prefer Icebreaker, honestly, but I, I, it was a fun read. But I do prefer Icebreaker. But there again. One off books are all fairly good. Favourite is still Peacekeepers of Soul. Okay. <whistles> Done. Let's put soft books in the top, shall we? Right. Robert Anna, can you please talk you talk about what you think late 1930s CRV would be uh, would do now, Dr. Clark, please? Um Let's put it this way, if they built it, and that would be contingent on them actually keeping the others in operation, it would be contingent on their surviving So that's the, the only way you can justify that. As said, I think in World War II, as I said in the sort of the larger video that came out on Saturday, um, I think it would have been a key part of their global presence from sort of mission. I think that's where you'd have found them being used. I think they would have been part of their patrol assets in low threat regions. So if you think about it, if you deploy something like that, an airship that size with those aircraft, okay, you're not going to deploy it to the coast of Japan. They'll get it killed. You're not going to deploy it to, you know, various places around the world. But if you have it wandering around the lower threat centers, the areas which are you know, less, uh, not as high risk, where there's conflict going on, but it's, maybe it's, you know, places like the coast of Australia, etc. You can have a patrol presence, keeping an eye on things, tell you if there's anything going on, and acting as a bit of a tripwire force. And if a major enemy forces turn up, well, if you lose them, it's not as big a blow as if you lose a full-sized aircraft carrier, is it? And let's be honest, you can have produced those a lot more cheaply and crew them a lot more cheaply than a full-sized aircraft carrier. So that's going to go like... Hang on. If I do... Can I put one of these in? And can I find a small book that fits in there? <laughs> Hello. Uh, yeah. You see, one of the joys of being a person who specialises in my field, you get a lot of people who give you books about paths to peace. And most of those books about paths to peace, I do love them from a point of view of they do speak of a hopeful world, of an idea of there is a path to peace. But the trouble is, the really big problem is that most of them require 
humans actually be better at humor, better humans to each other than they actually are as a historical rule. And I don't see that necessarily happening. Should I put the ducks in here? Yeah. Oh, where's, the, where's the other duck in here? No? Can't see the other duck. Train? Right. I have a feeling this is going to be quite a heavy box. Um, I-400 sim uh, submarines, yeah, it could well be doing replenishment missions, but again, the trouble is, the, uh, think about it, the areas you want to replenish are going to be the areas behind enemy lines. And that means you're going to be putting into a high threat area. If you're putting into a high threat area, you're going against what I initially said was the one thing you really don't want to do with it. Now, I did also suggest reconnaissance along the route for things like the, 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 the 1942 raids. And that makes sense. Why does that make sense? Why along the route of the raids? Because then the fleet doesn't have to do reconnaissance. It can just concentrate on moving as fast as it can and as efficiently it can while everything is being spotted and watched by the airships. Now, that's not going to be a perfect scenario. It really isn't, because let's be honest, the airships aren't perfect, but it will provide you with a measure of warning should anything be waiting for you, and hopefully spot things like the trawler fleet. So, questions. Questions. All right, then, where was I? Ah, uh, Vice Admiral Nelson. Was there any actual program to recast captured cannons in the Age of Sail, or what else was done to them with them? They were just re... Why would you recast the cannon? It works, it works, use it. Um, why do you, you don't need to recast it, it works. <laughs> um, yeah, you, you, that's a whole lot of extra effort you don't need to go to. Uh, if you, ca you capture the cannon, you use the cannon. Unless you decide you don't want to use those cannon, then they'll get put back into your general pool of cannon. They might get sold off. Um, quite a lot of Essex's ship uh, things were sold off. Oh, that camera's gone low. Um, this is exactly what I was worried about. Hello. <laughs> that's a whole different. Uh, that, that's put you down to that level. Let's see if that works. That's better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, but no, yeah, you didn't recast them. There are always people who talk about the various things. Occasionally, very rarely, if they're very bad cannon, something might happen to them. But the odds are they just don't get used. Uh, this is especially once you get onto iron cannon. When you have brass cannon, well, they're incredibly expensive, so they might. But, um... Again, unlikely, because it costs money to do it, and you've got a working cannon. Why would you recast it? Unless you're basically the British capturing the load of Spanish land cannon, you want to use them for ships. Then you might recast them, but usually what you do is, do is remount them. It's far quicker. That's a far more likely program, a far more common program, remounting cannon. Right. That's not as heavy as I was worrying it's going to be. Not as heavy as warning that mean they're going to be. Right then. Um, I think for you to get your space, I'm going to have to move that pile of books, aren't I? <laughs> okay. Uh, moving books. Um, Andrew Beaufort. Alt history, min and max. 1955. German technical mission tries to buy 12 41 centimeter, 45 cal from Japan. Uh, when would they be delivered? Well, Japan could build them, and they could probably deliver them very soon. Uh, if they're prepared to pay the price and offer it, 
then you're probably talking they could be delivered in 37 without too much trouble. Um, yeah, the Japanese are doing early experiments on the stuff which leads to the 18 inch, the 45, the 450 mils. But the reality is they have to keep the 16 inch program going because of the Nagato and because of their, of their existing ships. So they will do that. So therefore there is a production line. So they would just be feeding off that. And the production line, refit line, yeah. Whether they give them new ones or reboard ones is going to depend on how um, generous the Japanese are feeling. I would not at all be surprised about them getting reboard ones. The Japanese are like that sometimes. Oh, now the camera's blocking. <laughs> the camera's being blocked by that. Hello. <laughs> Oh, there's another big heavy book. Got to remember to put that bag and that in quite so soon. Ah. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to at some point get my colleagues when they come around to help me to help me reorganise the bo the boxes in here. Because they need a, a little bit of work. Just a little bit of work. Right. I have answered that one. Happy birthday, Stafford. In the house. Uh, Black Masters, was there anything stopping the Wayland Breach block from being invented earlier? Say, so or even in the 60s. Uh, metallurgy and someone actually having the idea. <clears throat> metallurgy, mainly understanding of metallurgy and pressures. Ooh. But that's about it. And I suppose some of the methodology used to make it, but honestly, there is quite a lot of that around already in the 1870s. The metallurgy is probably, uh, the metallurgy and idea is probably the biggest point. This is quite a small workout. Um, let's see. Um, Steve Richards, why do the British torpedoes work better in Narvik than the Germans? The British had tested their torpedoes more. Because, let's be honest, the British have an advantage. Uh, the British have the largest ongoing torpedo testing program for any nation in the world. And it starts in about ooh, 1890 and continues onwards. The Royal Navy has the ability to do testing in the Indian Ocean, the Mediterranean fleet, all around the world. They have lots and lots of ships which need to do test firings on a regular basis. So rather like we saw recently with the ballistic missile submarine, which was testing its launching facilities by launching old missiles, they have a lot of testing facilities where they are testing their torpedo. They, they are firing torpedoes anyway to test the launching facilities on the destroyers, on all the ships they're building, the submarines. Everyone has to fire torpedoes and test their, their systems work. And they have to do this on a regular basis. So we're not just talking once. Uh, we're talking, you know, once every, you know, once a year or something like that. And they have to test firing when they are testing their, uh, training their personnel and training the destroyer crews. They have to fire torpedoes, and so you do a lot of testing as a whole. And when you have the size of the navy, the Royal Navy is, and already it's desire towards testing, and especially the lessons after world, of World War One, where their shells hadn't worked. And that was what they felt was the one of the big things they felt was responsible for the results at Jutland. You suddenly get a navy which is obsessed with testing its weapons, and so they are testing them. And then on top of that, with the torpedoes that's under firing, there were some problems with British torpedoes at the beginning of World War II. Let me, but by no means were they all perfect, and always perfect at 100%. Um, the duplex torpedo had its own issues, and as a sort of methodology. But they were more reliable than pretty much everyone else's due to the sheer volume of testing. 
which actually makes the problems the Royal Navy did have even less excusable because of the sheer volume of testing. It's one of those things. They have, the, the fact they have as many problems as they do have is worrying. Sit down and have a drink. Eh, probably should do. I don't think I've got a drink out of the fridge yet. But let's get another one. Yabba. 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 Oh, that always feels good. And let's get the computers out of the way. I should really put these somewhere else. I'll take them up to my bedroom later. When we finish, remind me at the end of the screen to take my laptop, I'll take the old laptops up to my, uh, to my bedroom. Then I can install with the other stuff. Um, Black Maxus, using the SS Great Britain as a base, what could the Royal Navy arm and armor it along with modifications for the hull and promotion as a class of four? The Great Eastern. You're looking at basically a super warrior. So... I'm having to look up lengths and displacements from memory, because my memory of the Great Easterns is not as good as my memories of warriors. Excuse me a second. So... That's just so helpful, wasn't it? So, so helpful of you, Boxy. You, you, you feel you should be part of the stream now. I give you one second of the limelight, and you feel you should be part of the stream. I don't know. Seriously. You cardboard boxes. You're all the same. All ego. Yeah, one moment of limelight, and it's all you want. Da-da-da-da. I can't get to my... <laughs> I can't get to my keyboard. Okay, let me just... All right. Oh, if you want to be more worried, you should... Yeah, I was having some fun conversations today. Oops. Hello. Yes, I need to. I do need to lose some weight. But that would actually help if I could actually spend some time in the gym instead of sit on the phone to lawyers. That's a trouble. Oh, good lord. But I don't know. Right then. So. Great Eason. Now, Great Eastern is 20 years, about the same year as, actually, good old war, old war HMS Warrior. Warrior is roughly half the displacement. Oh... No, roughly a third of displacement of that. But let's be honest, she's two thirds of the length, roughly. Yeah, roughly. Well, hang on, no, it's 128 versus 211 meters. Well, yeah, it's, yeah, two thirds. Um, beam with a little bit. So yeah. Um, Well, the thing is, the Great Eastern carries five engines. So, four for the paddles and an additional one for the propeller. They can, do four, they can both do 14 knots, though. So, if you're going to build four of those to naval standards, you can armor it, but it's probably going to be armored the same as, uh, as Atreus Warrior. So, you're talking about an armor belt, which is... 
made up of iron and teak. And similar with bulkheads. So the armour was four and a half inches wrought back iron backed by 18 inches of teak. So that's pretty much what you've got, what you're probably going to have along it. Now with the Great Eastern you of course have those wonderful wheels in the middle so that's going to affect things. But I'm, I'm reckoning probably again you'll have a similar armament to Warrior as it's pretty much the same year. So you're probably looking at... Uh, that's got an extra that, so added that would all be added on to the armor armored citadel section. So you'd have roughly another ninety meters of armored citadel. You have the armored citadel historically is sixty four meters. So sixty five meters are historically. In this case, you probably have two broken up by the wheel in the middle. Let's say the wheel is... They are great wheels, so they are that. So they're roughly... So I have to give roughly 20 meters of my 100 and... Let's say 150 meters... 155 meters for that, so that's 135 meters, which means I've got honestly pretty much twice as much as I have on Warrior, so I would probably be going for uh, about 52, 68 pounder, um, 20, 10, 20 rifle breed rating 110 pounders, and um, for uh, eight, 40 pounders, so basically double the armament on Warrior, and that's probably what we'd be aiming for. Okay. And that's once you adjust all the stuff. Okay. Now, come on. Speaking of R3, G3, when the Royal Navy um, released info on ships order laid down, and when they released info about their capabilities, uh, the RN didn't release information on ships until they were laid down. And they didn't release info on their capabilities. Um, it, it it's you get the, most of the stuff when it's literally released. It's released as notifications to the government. You can't don't find press releases. You do not find things. And there's things like the size of the guns. Yes, they'll say that. Oh, they're going to be sixteen and a half inch guns, or they're going to be eighteen inch guns, but. Thickness of armor and those sort of things, and exactly how many arm bulkheads and those sort of scenarios, that's not released. It's similar to today. That's it, basically. Henry Ruffer, if Germany asked for the guns to be made to 42 centimeter, how much longer would it take? Then they'd have to build stuff from the NEU. So basically, the thing is, they have the stuff set up for the um, 406. They have they have stuff set up for the 16.1 inch. Um, they don't have the 16 and a half inch set up, so they'd have to set it up, and they'd have to do the calculations and build it all. So that's going to take longer. That's three, four, five years, and that's going to cut into their research abilities for their 18 inch program. So that's not going to be something they can take on. That's it. They they have enough infrastructure and in, in the place to do the research for the 18-inch program, or do the research for the 42, uh, for the four and a half inch, um, uh, 16 and a half inch program. They do not have enough infrastructure in place to do both. And that's pretty much one of the problems the British run into with the King George V, because they would have ideally loved to have worked on a 15-inch or 16-inch gun at the same time. The reason they couldn't do the work is because some bright spark had actually paid the facility which could have done, uh, could have spared some of the work, and some of the facilities which could have spared some of the work, to close. That bright spark, of course, was a certain chancellor of the treasury at the time period in the early 1930s. All those want to check, all those wanting to check up who that particular person is, just look up Chancellor of the Exchequer and look up the one for 1933.
if you if you find out that he's the same person who caused the who ha, who fa then found himself facing the problems of World War II and having to make decisions where he's worried about the fact that if the forces aren't ready for war, then you know who's responsible. Which is why I often say it's not Neville Chamberlain, the Prime Minister, who managed to muck up enough to lead to World War II. It's Neville Chamberlain, the Chancellor. Although, to be fair, he's closely followed by that Chancellor we had, 1924 to 1929, known as Winston Churchill, who really did muck things up. Um, George A, can you put your question in the question so I can get to it? You should, there should be a blue tab somewhere on the chat. And if you click on that, the question section should come up and it, it should go. If you put it in there, I will get to it in order with the questions and I won't lose it. But the trouble is, yeah, if it's in the chat, it, it might stay there. It might not. And sometimes the chat refreshes and I lose it. Whereas I don't, it doesn't refresh the questions. Nice to get everyone. So, without the treaty getting in the ways, it is fair and right to say the British Empire will be getting to super battleships, cruisers, and destroyers, and faces the problem of them before anyone else. How much does that benefit anyone else in the British? Um, it benefits the British because they probably adjust their infrastructure to fit it sooner. It benefits everyone else because that means the British are probably going to make them be running headfirst into making mistakes before they do. But there again, they're going to then be in competition with the British, and the British are going to know what mistakes they made, whereas others might not know. Thank you, George. Um, Black Maxus, do you have the tools to just build your own bookshelves for the new place? Um, I do have the tools, I don't have the time. So what I'm going to be doing is a lot of... Um, what I tend to call Alex shells, and what are actually called Calix shells from Ikea. Um, it turns out Drac has a whole host which he can let me have, and so they're going to be at short term whilst I get everyone set up, and then probably my next year's project, once we're in the place, is going to be building shelves. Or maybe it'll be in two years' project. It's going to depend on what the, what's going on in, the, in my world at the time. Blank messes, and also there's the fact of its cost and getting the wood together and all the things you need. I was very lucky with this place, the shells, and there was a lot of wood left over from the build of this off these lodges, mainly because I'm fairly certain they are at least one, possibly two, short in terms of um, the. If we, hang on, you can see those those ones. I think they they were supposed to be about another two levels above what they were, but the original builders built them and managed to ruin enough stuff that you know when me and Drac came to fix it we couldn't add those levels on, so we just fixed the roof, fixed the fixed the concrete, fixed everything, made it all work, made it all safe, made it all up to code, and I had a lot of wood left over so I built shells. And Black Mimosas, if the Germans had been more sensible relations with British and done just a tech race, do you think they would have ended up in a treaty like the British-Japanese Defence Treaty? Quite potentially. Because a tech treaty, a tech race is not the same problem for the British. If the Germans had responded to, let's say, at any instant of had been just building tech-wise, and had just joined in with the tech race, and hadn't said they were building enough to build Britain, and hadn't built, had been building a pair, or doing the same as America, building two, building one ship at a time, and just doing, you know, one or two as a class, two ship classes, the British would probably have, yeah, been a tech race, might well have been an alliance, might well have been something. Might not have been, because again, it's that much closer. Than Italy or Japan, um, uh, than Italy, America or Japan, and also there is the fact that traditionally they've always relied on Britain for the, to be the navy in the alliance. But the British would probably go, well, you know, they had the Franco-Prussian War, 
as long as they do not build and it's it's going to be assistance against the russians it's going to blockade up the russian fleet in the case of a franco-british war so if the germans want to dominate the baltic and that's what they're building their fleet for that's fine and that's that part of the attack race oh that's cool um yes akron had either akron or uh, either akron or macon uh, survive what to World War Two? Could they have been fitted to carry a CXM radar for early warning or scouting? If they'd been improved tech-wise as time went on, potentially they could. They might well have had to sacrifice other things for it, but they could have done. And honestly, if you if you give them the more powerful engines, you could have fitted with them at that time. That could have helped, and maybe you need to improve their um, balloons and their helium, etc. Um, you might also have other systems involved, but yeah, you could you could probably do something with that. Let's be honest, you could fit it instead of the whole mechanism which drops that thing, which go the pod which goes <laughs> flying out. Because no, 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 you're not getting me in one of those. You're not getting any. There is no one sane going in that one of those. Uh, Black Maxis, the Corgi and Poodle get turned into Great Danes the size of Just Nuisance. What happens? Uh, we go bankrupt. We go bankrupt. You saw how much it costs to feed Just Nuisance. Guess what? Imagine how much it would cost to feed two of them. We go bankrupt. Our family's not set up on... I would need to get a job working for a bank in central London. There is... Uh, the only way I could do... I could pay for that much food... I would have to be a multimillionaire. Or at least earning a lot of money. I would never get to be a multimillionaire because we'd be spending so much on dog food. Uh, Black Maxwell's. How would it change things if the United States had a night carry doctrine on part of the Royal Navy at the start of World War II? Imagine if Coral Sea had taken place at night. You might never get to the midway. Because I said, the problem for the Japanese is they have all the ideas they know about radar, they're developing radar, they don't have the infrastructure to implement radar. They have the idea about the British night fighting doctrine, they do know the British are pursuing, they don't have the infrastructure or ability to implement it. Japan's great weakness is infrastructure. And they only have so many researchers and so many people they can have working on things at once, and they only have so much of a system they can use. And that's their problem. So honestly, yeah. They have that. You have an advantage. They have, you know, the Americans have an advantage. Um, nice to hear everyone. So for a non-declined British Empire, how important would it be for them to get the first nuclear-powered supercarrier? It would certainly be a race. Importance... Who won it first would be important. I, I could see the British pushing that direction. But that's also going to be dependent on... Whether or not they're building carriers. Or what they're building carriers. And sort of those sort of things at good time. They're a maritime conglomerate. They need to be the first. Henry Rover, to my knowledge, Japanese 41 centimeters are 100 metric tons, and Japanese was 111 metric tons. So Sharnals could have been armed with six of them? Could it be done in secret in German fake barrels and call them alone in ships? No. Does Germany need to? Not by a time of Sharnhorst and Eisenhower, because that's naval treaty, Anglo German naval treaty. Um, the reason they're fitted with 11-inch guns is because they have no guns big and that ready. Not because they want to. So Sharnos and Eisenhower could both be fitted with them. Yeah. They don't, remember, Sharnos and Eisenhower don't get, law, don't get, uh, don't get commissioned. Remember, they don't go, they don't finish their testing. The Germans commission a ship and then put it for its full testing. The British put a ship for its full testing and then commission it. Which is why it's kind of weird that Prince of Wales has still got dockyard workers on her when she goes out to sea to chase um, the Bismarck, because basically the British don't do that. 
Uh, the, usually they, the ship has to be fully fine and fully cleared by the dockyard before it's commissioned. It gets launched, it's blessed, all those things, but it's not commissioned. My turn. So without the second London Naval Treaty, would the illustrious class have been 27,000 tons? Without the first London Naval Treaty, they'd have been 27,000 tons. By the time the second London Naval Treaty comes along, their design has already been locked in. So, if you think about it, the illustrious class, they are lay ordered in April, March, and January 1937, and July 1937. And that's Indomitable, which is the modified, expanded illustrious class. So, and if you think about her, she goes up, you know, goes up quite a big chunk in various options. So, and then straight after them, I, I think the answer is the class that are ordered next are implacable, are the implacables. And they are very close to 27,000 tons in standard. So basically, if you want to know what the world would look like if the first London Naval Treaty hadn't included cumulative tonnage limits, limitations, then the Royal Navy, probably Arc Royal onwards, would have looked like the implacable class. It would have been one long implacable class series. So that's what you'd be looking at. Uh, they might have slightly bigger hangers. But pretty much what you'd be dealing with is one long implacable class. So, Arc Royal, Illustrious, uh, Victorious, Formidable, Indomitable, probably Implacable, Indefatigable. And, you know, those things, especially if there's no cumulative limits, they would have just kept building those. They would have just kept churning them out. Probably one would have been coming off the production line a year. After about two years points. So from, if 1930 long the treaty hadn't had the cumulative limits, then 1932, an indefatigable, uh, implacable S carrier would have been available. Maybe 1933, you know, it's a case of uh, when are they starting ordering? Are they, you know, uh, Arc Royal is ordered. Nineteen thirty-four, so maybe they wait till nineteen thirty-four till Admiral Henderson is pushing them, but that would mean nineteen. She's laid down nineteen thirty-five, and she's commissioned nineteen thirty-eight. You know that sort of. She's laid down September nineteen thirty-five, launch thirty-seven, commissioned nineteen thirty-eight because they're testing for her. But probably you would then have had you would have probably had a pair of ships ordered at the time because no cumulative limit. And then a pair of ships would be on the 1935 program, a pair in the 1936 program, a pair in the 1937 program, and so you'd have probably about eight, nine ship, eight, ten ships coming into service by World War Two. So that's that. That's what you'd be dealing with if there's no cumulative limit, or if there's a ten ship cumulative a cumulative limit, they'd pretty much be implacables. So you know, it's it's. Fun, but not massively complicated to work out that one because the implacable class shows you exactly what they want when they. The implacable class are the ones which are designed and put through when they have no cumulative, cumulative limit. That shows you exactly what they wanted. Uh, nice Aaron. Question 46. Would it make sense for the British to build loads of cruisers and destroyers as a way to get itself out of the Great Depression? Yes. In fact, they literally are building the town class and other cruisers to try and help that. And that's what the Royal Navy have been planning and the Treasury to extent been planning before the second London Naval Treaty, uh, the, uh, 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 the first London Naval Treaty. Old history. Uh, 62,000 metric ton for 53 centimeter, for 53 centimeter single turrets. Would this cause other nations to spend massive amounts of money to build infrastructure for 80,000 tons? No. No, it wouldn't. Because, yeah, you've got four 20-inch guns, but they're in single turrets. And you are not going to be able to do salvo-ranging fire with, those, with, that, with that layout. You just aren't. Uh, Blackmail Maximus. Uh, you know, if you've got mo a brand new modern ship, maybe, with radar and all computer systems. But if you're talking about 1920s, 30 seconds, nope.
Um, do, 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 do. Long what if the 1870 devastation class had the same displacement as the S's Great Eastern? What could be added or changed in design? Well, you're basically adding roughly 20,000 tons onto the design. So you're again trebling the size. Um, at that point, I would expect you to somehow get up to eight um, 12 inch guns. So you probably ha you'd have to you have the bar but lower barbettes and then have higher barbettes. Um, goodness gracious me, they they just be massive, okay? They just be colossal. Um, a massive increase in range, but mainly it's the guns. They, they'd be almost a pre-runner of the Dreadnought. Because you'd have raised barbettes with the guns in. Because that's, you know, you've not got turret structure, you've got raised barbettes. Which could actually cause an interesting thing, because if you have that come on with eight guns... Well, they have they have turrets, sort of, they have a sort of turret, yeah, but they don't, they're not elevating turrets, but they're, they're fine, they're turrets. Of a kind. Yeah, so they, they, they'd have turrets, basically. They'd have four turrets. Uh, potentially, they would go for a diamond arrangement, but I doubt it. Now, Megasphere, if a battleship ironclad was thinking along the lines of ironclad CSS Virginia with a USS Monitor style turret, how reasonably realistic feas feasible? You could build it. How well it will work is a completely different matter because the Vir Virginia is an interesting design, and if you uh, want uh, an ironclad USS Monitor. Let, let me put it this way, that's, that sounds like a good way to make something that's going to sink in high seas, in moderate seas. Um, the Virginia is pretty much a very good vessel for protecting a river mouth, but that's about it. You don't want to take it out in the water. And let's be honest, the monitor, you really don't want to take it out in the water as well, because that's why its fate is what it is. Peter Smith, hello. Um, quick answer to that question is, because uh, that is in the qu uh, questions. Uh, did the Royal Navy have... Why has that gone on to questions instead of live? No idea why. Okay. Look, look. Did the Royal Navy have its own version of Bureau Honours as an organisation that kept getting in the way? Not particularly. Not the same. They had... The, these things are mostly run through the Third Sea Lord's office. And controllers tend to be kind of brutal. They have various officers and various departments which are involved in the procurement of ordnance, true. But they're all, to an extent, kept on monitored and, to an extent, report to the Third Sea Lord and the set First Sea Lord. And, basically, the argument, the idea is, if you really don't want to have a meeting to have a Third Sea Lord, if you have to have a meeting with the First Sea Lord, you're not going out of it alive, or rather, in your post. So, they don't, aren't not the same. It's a different organization uh, or structure. Um, what books would you recommend on evolution of naval maritime steam engines in the 19th, of the 19th century? Ask me that question of unpacked these boxes, not with them packed, okay? They're in that 
that box down there. Um, no, just not going there. Not going there. Sorry, no. Um, do, 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 do. Unless they're really, uh, they are up there. No, they're not. Um, George A, did the British ever think about building a carrier on the 10,000 tons to get around the Washington Naval Treaty like Japan's Uruguay? Would have given them a hull to patrol the Empire. They built Hermes. This is the quick answer. Um, basically, they built Hermes and they decided that's as small as they want to go. Remember, they had Argus. Argus was below that level. They had Hermes. They knew exactly what they wanted and they decided they didn't like it at that level. As I've said before, uh, 15,000 tons is about the limit. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. And, you know, that's the thing. If they could have got that through, they'd have been really, really happy. Um, Black Moses, how many Candy class cruisers could the British have built before the London Naval Treaty? What could, would the impact be if the British had built far more Candy class cruisers? If the British had decided to cheat building four a year from about 1922 onwards to about 19 into 1930... Barring might take about two years to build them, so you would have by 19, it'd take off two years, that takes it down to about six years, you could have 24 in service. So the British could have had 240,000, and that's four a year. They could build six to eight quite happily. So if they'd really max it out and decided to build eight a year, then they could have had 48,000 or 48 in service, not 48,000, 48 in service, and which is 480,000 tons of heavy cruiser. And that would have really made things interesting for the Americans, because let's be honest, the treaty limits on cruisers would have been what? 500,000 tons, 500, uh, you know, for light cruisers and heavy cruisers? At 10,000 tons a pop, the British could have had 50 of each and been happy. The Americans would be going, ah, we're going to spend a lot of money. They do it, but, you know. The ones who'd be really happy would be the Japanese. Although they wouldn't be able to build anything like that to match it. And what would be the impact if the British had done it? It would have been quite useful economically. Militarily wise, the British had a lot more ships. A lot more ships. World War Two, interwar period, a lot more ships. And let's be honest, that that just causes more and more trouble for the Germans in World War Two, if that happens. Uh, Paul from Chicago, why do you think no one had the gumption to tell a German ambassador Bel Belgium means war? Um... It's neither of those options. It's neither moral cowardness or desire for a continental war. They do, but they tell them in diplomatic language. Belgium means war. Belgium, But the trouble is the Germans aren't listening, or specifically Kaiser Wilhelm isn't listening. Kaiser Wilhelm believes that the British won't do it because he has a great affection for Britain and Britain understands him and he loves Britain and, you know, all these things. Um, he believes that the British will not do it. And he actually, after one of the wars, he goes, why have they done this? This is so surprising. Well, the British have in diplomatic language told him. Your question, though, basically means is why does no one speak plainly and say it in simple terminology? And I would argue the reason is because they are so used to using diplomatic language and diplomatic channels that that's what they speak in. And they expect that to be understood. But the trouble is, when you're using diplomatic language, it requires that everyone in the diplomat uh, involved understands diplomatic phraseology. And whilst Queen Victoria and the various King Edwards and King Georges had certainly, in British history, had been taught to understand diplomatic language, that's part of the training of being a monarch in the UK, is learning how diplomatic language and diplomatic phraseology. There's a reason they go to the places they go to and they learn the language, the stuff they do. There's a reason they're taught the way they are, to learn diplomatic phraseology, because they're the head of state, so they need to use diplomatic phraseology. Um, 
but it, the trouble is, Kaiser Wilhelm hadn't. The trouble is, the Americans weren't speaking any blunter. No one was speaking bluntly. They were all speaking in diplomatic language, and honestly, you did need someone to sit there and go, this is what this means. But the, that's... I think that's part of the argument which isn't really said by Andrew Lambert when he's talking about Jackie Fisher's impact if he'd been first Sea Lord in 1914. Because Jackie, uh, Jackie Fisher does do blunt language. So Jackie Fisher would have done, If this, I will have the fleet of the German coast, and if they cross into Belgium, we will blast our way through the Kiel Canal. He'd have said something like that. And that would have had the necessary impact. And he'd have had the fleet positioned to say that was the case. But you see, the trouble... That's, that's his skill. That's the skill sometimes of deterrence. Having someone in a suitable position who will speak like that. They often can't be the person in charge. But they need to be senior enough that people need to think, think, think that the person in charge is listening to what they say. And that's it, basically. No, look at U.S. diplomacy. In fact, look at the trouble the U.S. gets into. They often speak more, uh, more diplomatically than anyone else. This is the trouble. In the nicest way, again, this is what gets a lot of diplomats into trouble. There was a, a video of a... There was a... Uh, interview of a, a former British Foreign Office diplomat the other day and um, because some diplomats have been putting forward the case that they want to change the Foreign Office around. Personally, I don't agree with it, but I can see their reason for the reasoning for their arguments. I don't think that actually changes things. They don't like being called the Foreign and Commonwealth Ox Office because they think it, it, um, it shows off the trappings of empire and it's too much linked to the past and that they feel, they feel that's a baggage. Myself, I think that's more of an advantage if you want to use it as such. But I think the trouble is they're not sure how to... The, the, quite a lot of the newer diplomats might not be quite so comp confident in how to use that because of the way diplomatic language has gone. And because of a lot of the world they perceive themselves to be operating in and how they perceive themselves to be operating. And you do have all sorts of issues in that who's attracted to foreign uh, to civil service, who's attracted to foreign service, etc. One of the things I do love when people go, oh, you really don't get the right sort of people in the foreign office these days. I go, well, you get the people who want to do it. So if you don't agree with the people in the foreign office and you, want, uh, you think there should be others in the foreign office, well, then go join the foreign office. It's kind of like the armed forces. If you don't like the people in the armed forces, go join the foreign office, uh, armed forces. Um... It's, you know, my main, uh, I, I had this question recently with uh, some people who was in there going, complaining about um, women in the armed forces recently. And they were all blokes about my age, complaining away, da 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 And I went, well, how many of you have served? None. Well, in the nicest way, the armed force in the UK are volunteers. Um, they're going to do everything they can to widen the pool of volunteers that they can, because they need people to volunteer. If you want to complain about who's in the armed forces from the sidelines and never join, well, that's your right in a democracy, but it's a little bit hypocritical. In a democracy, you're allowed to complain about these things. True. But if you've never had any intention of joining, never in an interest in joining, then don't complain about the people who do join. Do join. And don't, if you have never tried to go for those standards or never been able to pass those standards, don't complain about the people who do pass the standards. Just don't. Because that's a bit, in my view, that's hypocritical and rude. But it's the same with the Foreign Office. The people who join there are the people who want to be in the Foreign Office. And often they are people, their job is to sit kind of like, kind of like I've described how I do sometimes as an academic. I sit between the armed forces and the government and I sometimes act as the explainer. I literally translate from one to the other. Because sometimes you need that. Sometimes you need that kind of, ability, and that kind of person there. The Foreign Office is supposed to be the explainer of the British government to the outside world and the explainer of the outside world to the British government. Which means they're a translator in the middle. Which means they need to be able to see both sides because you can't be a good translator if you don't understand both sides. And that's sometimes a problem because sometimes you have members of the Foreign Office who are better at understanding the other side 
and sometimes foreign officers, uh, of members of foreign officers who aren't better on setting your side. But that's because they're humans, like everyone else, and they're who volunteered to be there, and that's who you've got to work with. So, yeah. And a brother, if Germany start a journey... For Thirty-five stops, eleven fifteen-inch, um, fifteen-inch, sixteen-inch gun development, and starts on six point watch, uh, and a barge frigate gun of eighteen to twenty-two. When could they have six or so guns? Um, if they're putting in the same resources into it in nineteen thirty-five, they're building from scratch. They're building everything from scratch. They also have the fact they haven't done it for so long. You're probably talking 40. If you're talking 16.1 inch and 18 to 22 inch guns for barge frigate. Um, so, yeah, you're, you're, you're probably talking uh, 39, 40, maybe even 41. Um, kind of Cameron, there's a book on. Portsmouth, written by um, Port, uh, uh, Portsmouth in World War Two, oh, which was written by uh, commissioned by uh, by I think the the ta uh, the council. Um, that it's a good one. It's got the pictures in it. But I think it's Portsmouth Harbour or Portsmouth City, World War Two. I think the book's tagline is something like that. Um, it's got a fun name, but it's got a tagline of something like that. Again, it's in boxes somewhere. Second error, just before Trafalgar, the Franco-Spanish fleet gets an American shipment of double-barreled shotguns, load of 00 buckshot shells. Do those firearms get liberally distributed in the fleet? How does that change Trafalgar? Not a jot. That, that's good. That's going to help them. Yeah. But it's not the, it's not the, the um, shotguns which are really doing the suppressing fire of the rifles. I know they famously take out Admiral Nelson, and it could make things interesting in some of the boarding actions, but um, honestly, it's not really going to help that much, because they're not pump you know, You're not getting a pump-action shotgun in that period. You're not getting anything. You're just getting uh, a, you know, a double-barreled shotgun. You fire your shells, boom, boom. You then cl you sort of have to reload them. It's... It's quicker than a musket, but it's not really going to help with all the smoke and all the stuff things going around. You're not, you're just firing the things, and it's not going to get through the decks. And yeah, if someone's hit by all of them at closer range, yeah, but at longer range, mm, yeah, it's boarding actions. But again, the trouble is with boarding actions is usually the decks already been sweeped by people firing cannon and in the nicest way boarding actions down below you rarely get time to fire guns if they're getting through the cannon loopholes and they've control already got control of your deck they're coming in you're gone it doesn't matter how how much you have in terms of buckshot Nice government. Question forty-five. How bad would it look? Uh, would it look if the battleship that was sunk with repulse was HMS King Edward the Eighth and not Prince of Wales? Um, there is a reason the Royal Navy. Do, well, that would have looked a lot worse. But don't take this the wrong way. But a battleship named King Edward the Eighth would not have been sent out on a solo posting like that. It just wouldn't. It would have been Duke of York. That's the reality. Or whichever of the admirals. Um, hang on, was it? So it would be Anson. HMS Anson. Uh, Duke of York, I think, was originally going to be. Um, so it would have been Anson, as it was, as it would have been called at the time. Andrew Bufa, 1938. Joan finishing free Shan Horse class, armed with 60. Where are they getting the. Okay. Alright. Let's say they do have the infrastructure available to do a third Shan Horst. And it doesn't. It takes till 1939 to finish Shan Horst herself. It's Nisenau, nice which is done in thirty-eight. It's Scharnhorst is commissioned in January nineteen thirty-nine, and then they're, they're not really ready. But I carry on. Um, 
armed with 16.1 inch and are laying down one ship with approximately 62,000. What did, uh, uh, would this change the Royal Navy historical build? Yes, there's no chance the Royal Navy have built a Kingdom of this. In the nicest way, for the Germans to be doing that. Okay. So. Oh, I still can't believe we, uh, that's not. They are laid down in 1935. The King George V are laid down in 1936, almost a year later. Now, if the British had spotted those being built and they were going to have 16.1 inch guns, and one of the things, the interesting things about Britain in terms of Germany, is you can guarantee the intelligence would have told them they were going to have 16 inch guns. Um, you would be at least facing 15 inch gunned King George Vs, but probably 16 inch gunned. And if Germany's building three of them, then the Royal Navy are probably building at least six, if not more. So that's the scenario you're dealing with. Uh, the King George V, one of the reasons why they are 14-inch guns and they go with 14-inch guns is because of the uh, lovely fact that the Sharnos and Nystown are on 11-inch guns and they know it. So they can justify putting them through. But if they're on 16-inch guns, then King George V is about six of them ordered. And they're going to be 16-inch gun ships. They're going to be nine 16-inch gun ships. And the Shan Horse, well, their top speed is... 31 knots. The King George Vs are 28 knots. That's probably fine. The British might want to go a bit faster. The British might push it up. But remember, uh, theoretically, they are limited by speed, by treaty. But they might well decide the... Well, they already do decide they're going to have hang-on armor, because if you consider this, the King George Vs are built with an external belt, and that means you can ba you can do all sorts of interesting things with that belt. Um, you can have real fun with that belt. With that belt, uh, so the British will probably mod uh, would probably just go design it for a 16-inch belt or something greater. Uh, in certain in certain points, and make it a speed of roughly thirty knots. You can maybe maybe push it up to thirty one, but probably not worry too much, because they just need it fast enough so that the sixty uh, so that the Sharnos can't decide the range, and the British will go for a sixteen inch gun, the Mark II version of the Nelson Rodney, and Nelson Rodney will probably get the upgraded guns as well as part of it. Or alternatively, if they are still being pushed by people to go, we oh we want the treaty, we want. We want you to try and get the treaty down to 14-inch guns. Well, the Germans are building a 16-inch gun ship. We still want you to do that. Well, the 15-inch gun is it. What would go? And then there'd be a 9 15-inch gun ship. It might even be... They might even try and push it more and basically go in the 1937 treaty because um, they are waiting for the tr the, tre the second Washington Naval Treaty to go through to an extent. Um, they might even push that slightly more. Uh, they might be tempted to accept the autoloaders, um, sure, but I'm going to get it right. I do this every week. Shivra. Shivra. I'm getting closer. Um, yeah, they, they, Shivra, they, uh, mm, they might be tempted. Uh, uh, if the Germans had 16 and a half inch guns, then mm, that probably going to. But also, there's the fact that the British are developing their own gun at times. So there is the fact that if the Germans go for a 16 and a half inch gun, and Hendrix question was about a 16.1 inch gun, so that's I, I kept it to four or six mm because that's easiest. The British might go for a 16 and a half inch gun themselves, but the 16 inch gun is technically the limit in the 1937 London Naval Treaty, so they would probably go with a 16 inch gun, and they would go with nine of them, if not more. They might use the and if the Germans are building something a ship of approximately 62,000 tons in 1938, then the British probably issue escalator clause scenario and start building their own big ships. 
They might go 15 inch 50s. They might be tempted up, but it's a case of it's going to be, it's going to be a discussion. It's what I can tell is it wouldn't be the 14 inch gun. Um, do -do -do -do. <clears throat> Shivra, if the lower limit for carrier size under the terms of the Russian Navy Treaty was large enough that Hermes technically wasn't a carrier, would there be a removal of the lower bound on the carrier size under the Navy Treaty? Um, probably not. <clears throat> probably not, because if Hermes wasn't a, wasn't considered a carrier treaty, so let's say the limit was 12,000 or 50, or let's say the limit for cruisers, or let's say the British have built a 9 point. We'll go with the only ones who are building cruiser this time, large cruiser of British. So let's say instead of building the 7.5 inch Hawkins class, they built the 9.2 inch gun Hawkins class version, which they were talking about, which was going to have twin turrets and about four of those, or, f or possibly five, depending on the argument uh, idea. And it was going to be about uh, 15, uh, probably about 14,000 tons in standard, honestly. 14,000, 15,000 tons in standard. 14, 15,000 tons in standard. Um, now. The thing is, if that becomes the limit, so that you can build vessels up to, as many vessels as you like, carriers up to 15,000 tons, and they don't count towards your carrier tonnage, that's going to be a very different scenario, because the British will probably build three or four of those. And the reason why the British will build three or four of those is those are their present ships around the world. And they're not going to want them taking away from their fleet carrier tonnage, because under that scenario, the British then get five fleet carriers of 27,000 tons at 135,000 tons. Well, in the nicest way, the British will. Uh, the only carriers which are going to count towards that tonnage at this point are going to be Eagle, Furious, Courageous, and Glorious. And if we consider in limitations those. Uh, do, 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 do. London ships. I have huge, great big Excel spreadsheets with these things in. Where are they? <laughs> Where are my massive Excel spreadsheets? I need them. Uh, da -da -da -da. So if you consider that Hermes is only ten thousand eight hundred fifty tons, so if you you she's quite clear. Argus is fourteen thousand four hundred fifty tons. She's now not included. So you've got Eagle of twenty two thousand tons, Furious, and Courageous and Glorious. They're twenty four thousand. They're they're less than twenty five thousand tons. But we'll take sort of twenty four thousand, twenty five thousand, and uh, twenty three thousand and twenty two thousand. So that's forty five thousand plus forty nine thousand. That's eighty ninety four thousand tons, which would leave them with. Uh, 35 plus that 41,000 tons of building carriers. They could build another couple of carriers happily on that one. But the thing is, they would probably still build those carriers, but they wouldn't have to worry about Argus, they wouldn't have to worry about Hermes in this scenario. And they could build as many of the smaller carriers as they wanted. So they could play around with those, they could build those, and then they build what they need to when they need to build it. And it changes the scenario because again, it, you might be you probably more tempted to go with the five twenty seven thousand tons or far larger carriers, um, in terms of or six, you know, you'd probably go with six twenty two and a half thousand ton carriers or something aiming for that, 
because you can build, let's say, 12 of the smaller carriers and have them around. You wouldn't need to worry about a unicorn size thing. You might still build a unicorn because, well, it's nice to have, and if you can get it through the tonnage limitations, you're going to go with it. But, yeah, you don't need to. Knight C3-1, uh, was a 1939 King George V class inevitable? No. King George V class are not a fixed point in time. This is not Doctor Who. You change the world beforehand, there's going to be a different scenario. There might well be a class built in 1939, uh, in 19, ordered in 1937 that gets, uh, it starts to come into service in 1939, 1940. There might be, but there also might not be. You know, if there's a pace of construction going, then they might not fit with that. If you consider it, if you've got the G3s, and then two years later the N3s are ordered, and then two years later the next class is ordered, and two years later the next class is order, ordered, well, if you're starting off in 1919, then you have a class in 1937 ordered, but that could be, if they've kept up with a class, a new class every two years being ordered, then that would be class number 10 and 9 or 10 since uh, the end of World War 1 and that's if they keep it two years if they split it up to three years it's not going to be that year is it make it every three years they're ordering class All right, that, that's just not the thing Megasrop, thank you for the elaboration. The idea of the Virginia Monotocon was to, to a large, sea capable iron hold, iron-clad, heavily armed broadside casemates, add a turret. How could that have been done? Well, you could have built the casemates and etc. things uh, like sort of that on a larger hull, and then you could have put the turrets either end, I suppose. Um, if you put a turret in the center, it's going to be too high a center of gravity. So it's too high a center of mass. So you can't do that on top of it. So it has to go either end, or you put it down, and then you have the broadside sections either side of it. In which case, it can't fire forward. It can only you you, you know you basically have to put it fore and end, fore and aft, which would help because that would deal with some of the issues with the your arrangement of a broadside structure. All the British battlecruisers are replaced by copies of Adrian's Hood as her 1920 self. As the battlecruisers sail against the Germans and Germans, what happens? A massacre of the first scouting group. Because if you've got Hoods backed up by um, Queen Elizabeth class, that's what you'll get. A massacre of first scouting group. And I don't think you get the Battle of Jutland. You get another battle between the battle of the scouting group forces, but... With that many ships, you're, you're talking about first uh, the British battlecruiser force. Um, come on, Jutland. Come on, Excel spreadsheet. Open up. Order a battle, Jutland, so I can uh, so I can rattle this off. Um, the British have. At the battle, Tiger, Queen Mary, two li uh, the, the, the two lions, and the two indefatigables, in the battle cruiser fleet. I think it was. Yeah, you have Lion, you have Princess Royal, you have Queen Mary, you have Tiger, you have New Zealand, uh, you have New Zealand and indefatigable. So. You would have six ships, each with eight 15-inch guns. So that's 48 15-inch guns. And then you have 
5th Battle Squadron, which ha brings you another 32 15-inch guns. So you'd have 80 15-inch guns in that force. Against that... Not only that, they'd be massive and very survivable. Against that, in terms of the first scouting group, uh, they have Lutzel, De Flinger, Seidlitz, Moltke, and Von der Tann. Um, they're good ships, but they're not designed to take on Hood in her 1920 form. Knight 681, you're welcome to think that. You are welcome to think that that's where the Royal Navy would be by that period. But I don't... The, the point I would make is, yes, I do answer alternate history, and I do do alternate history questions. But there is a certain... Po I always, with those questions, have a fixed point, to, have points of which I won't go beyond, because beyond that, I cannot predict the future. If you're in a scenario where the G3s and N3s are built... You can predict sort of what the next five, six years are going to be of construction. You can maybe make it to 1930. Because especially if you have a treaty scenario still going forward, you can look at the existing treaty. You can look at what they use as the models for that. Uh, you can decide how they work. You can work through that and you can go, right, and this is the standardization. But you can't go much later than that. And that's with all sorts of codicils. Because you change the history so much. So you are welcome to believe that. You are welcome to think that. But the thing is, as I've pointed out before, on this channel, in this role, I answer naval history questions, including alternate ones. And to remind myself of the standards I have to keep when I'm writing and uh, uh, doing things, as I said before, explanation, I am Dr. Alex Clark. So the thing is, I have to be able to substantiate what I am saying. I have to be able to back it up. Now, sometimes I'm wrong, and I say I'm wrong. Because uh, if I'm asked a question, and I go from memory, and that memory can be wrong. But in this scenario, you're asking me to support a conclusion you have on something which is a long way away from which I do not have the data to be able to back up. Because there are so many variables at play that at that point, I cannot postulate with any degree of accuracy. And I'm saying I'm not going to because of that. You are my, You might well be right. You also could be very well be wrong. Because a treaty might come in which says they can do a maximum of 60,000 tons. Or alternatively, the treaty might come in after the Americans have launched an absolutely massive Tillman and have said it might be 100,000 tons, in which case everyone could be building 100,000 ton ships. That's the problem. Blavin Maxus, you and Drac replace BT and Jellico at Jutland. The ship ship crew can replace other officers. How do you fight Jutland in the war? As you've written it, I'm replacing BT, Dract replacing Jellico. So that's where I'm going with, right? For starters, I'll be communicating with Je with Jellico, or with Drac, and telling him what's going on, and I'll make sure on communication. I'm going to make sure Seymour's replaced by one of those uh, one of those replacements. I want Seymour replaced, but um, I want someone who's going to know the actual communication stuff. So I'm sorry, Dr. Dan, you're wonderful. I'm going with Garius. Um... <laughs> <laughs> to replace Seymour. It's just sensible. And, um... Yeah, that, that's basically where we go. We go with Garius. Um, and that will sort of deal with that scenario. Let's just do this for now, because it just makes more sense. And so I start boxing again. I've been doing this for ages, and I just kept going, shall I, shall I not? Mm. Um, how do we fight Jutland? We probably, with the communication working, and we're us actually communicating with each other, what am I going to do next? Um, 
make sure not only is my seaplane carrier being supported, but uh, um, hopefully send a message to Drac to make sure he has his seaplane carrier with him as well and doesn't get sent home under escort and has them operating seaplanes as often as it can to provide information about what the Germans are doing. I will slow down my chase. If I'm taking over at the beginning, I won't be chasing as, as fast as, as um, BT. I will be... Probably slow my speed down to... Not quite match that of the Queen Elizabeth class, but do it so I'm only going about a knot or so fast now. Make sure... Thomas knows what I'm doing. And, yeah, work uh, work it. How are we going to change it? Well, the thing is, if we know what's going to happen, and we know what they did historically, <sighs> what do I want to do? I want to try and curve around and cut between the scouting group and the high seas fleet and charge through them. I want to literally cut them in half. And I want to do it in such a way that I charge through them, blasting away with everything I can. I want them to think I'm in a, the Grand Fleet's in a completely different direction than it is by coming from a different direction. And then race. So that they then race after me. After I've caused them sufficient damage. In the nicest way, if I can do it so that I can work with Thomas so that he is... It's going to sound strange. The battle cruisers sort of come from down here, boom, boom. And then they run, and them chasing after me to run into the Queen Elizabeth. And then I fought them and try and take out first scouting group. If I can take out first scouting group, then probably the high sea fleet withdraws. But if they don't, if they continue trying to follow me to try and beat up my section of the Grand Fleet, especially if I'm withdrawing, as far, withdrawing at that point... Um, because I'll try and smash and run. Then probably I will lead them on to Drac with the Grand Fleet. And I will be telling him exactly what's going on and making sure he knows that's going on. Because that'll be basically Gar Garius' job. Tell Ga Drac exactly what the friggin' I'm doing all the time. And, um, let him do his, jo uh, his job then. But the thing is, um, I would. It depends how quickly, when we replace them. So, do we replace them? Uh, I would love to change the safe shell handling practice, Carmen Gasberg. But if I've literally chain, uh, changed places with BT on the morning of Jutland, there's no chance of me doing that. Okay, that's not that's not something I can change as a solid practice with a signal. I can send out a message of please maintain safe handling practices of shells, but they're going to ignore it because they're going into battle. That's something I need to go around to every single ship and talk through. Uh, Dan's job, yes. Dan, Dan can keep sending bad puns at Shear. Uh, Luke Davenport, do you have any good book suggestions for someone looking for more information on the Madagascar campaign in the Napoleonic Wars? Uh, there's actually a good section in Nicholas Rogers' Command of the Oceans. Uh, if you've, and that then has good links and good suggestions for other books in it from memory. If you look at where it's referencing to. Um, do, 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 do. My turn. Were the British really that worried about the US Navy build-up? Mm, not worried, but they were keeping a notice on it. It's it's one of those scenarios. You have to remember, one of the interesting things people go, the Americans were planning to build so many 16-inch gun ships. The British already have. How many 15-inch gun ships? It's just the next generation. The British don't mind. It's part of the whole competition they've had going on with the Americans for a while by that point. I'm happy to help, Luke. And repeating this, yeah, so basically, it, it's a case of, it's nothing, I, I cannot, I would have to be replacing BT six months before the Battle of Jutland. 
to have that chance. And in a nicest way, the if we consider when do, uh, that sort of would be, um, doo -doo -doo. Round on list of battles. Da, 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 da. If I replace him in September, well, it's, that's when I said May. So that would be what? November 1915. Then I have a lot of time to play with. I can do a lot of things in six months. But if I replace him. In May 1916, then there's only so much I can do. But honestly, if I replace him in November 1916, then what I possibly do is I uh, not only do I, st I start the rotation of battle cruiser squadrons up to ju up to Scarpa Flow for gunnery training immediately, and I have the gunnery officers of the Grand Fleet and the gunnery instructors up there. Repeat my instructions ad nauseum and absolutely bash it into them. I also probably have some other things sorted out as well by then. I'm gonna have I've got that much time to train my crews to better coordinate with aircraft, to train the seaplane carriers, to do all sorts of little things today. If I've got that much time, give me six months from May, September from October, November 1915 to May 1916 to prepare for the Battle of Jutland, and the Battle of Jutland will be a frigging massacre. That's the reality. You get you send four of us back to that period, then the Battle of Jutland, when it happens, when the Germans come out, will be a massacre. Because we will change things so much. Can you imagine mine and Drax's knowledge of radio, radar, and the budget of the Royal Navy in 1915, 19, beginning in 1916? It's a nightmare for them. It would be a night. It would be a nightmare. This is one of the reasons why I don't believe in time travel because I also don't trust that anyone going back in time will not be able, will be able to keep their mouth shut. But if which country had it worse to get money from the government for the navy? It's an argument between France and Germany, honestly. Depending on the history period. Um, the Americans often had it very, very bad. Frankly, India during colonial rule almost had it impossible. Um, yeah, that there, there are lots of issues with getting money for a navy. Nine six eight three one. The Treasury gets an advantage because of the treaties, because that already implements a, a limit on construction, and then they put in the 10-year rule. If there's no treaties, there's no ground for the 10-year rule. And the British government is long well aware of the verse that it is better be in times of peace you prepare for war. If you seek peace, prepare for war. And it's far better to be prepared in peacetime. And they also have quite a big political machine. And that is another thing which gets a lot of undermining in 1920s and 30s. Order temporal police works well. I have a full affection for police forces. I have worked with many over the years. Um, none of them are 100% are, are perfect, and that is the trouble. Once you get into temporal, uh, temporal time plan, uh, uh, temporal um, time maths.
Lamorous, what if shell guns had been invented in combat by the time of Trafalgar? Then, A, you would have seen things like HMS Warrior appear a lot earlier. If you've got shell guns, that's why you need armor. That's why they start having iron backed by teak. And that's when you start looking for other means of power to move your ship through the water, because sails can work, but they're not that great when you've got a hull which is that heavy. Um, so, that's if you've got shell guns at the Battle of Trafalgar, and invented a comb by the, the Battle of Trafalgar, then there's going to be a massacre of fleets. There's going to be a lot of dead ships. Because wooden ships do not do well with shells. So, they either have converted... In which case, considering the British experience with coppering bottoms and the various other things they've done, and the industrialization of the British systems, you might well have a warrior-esque vessel at the Battle of Trafalgar, because, let's be honest, um... The Trafific steam engines are around uh, around by 1800. There have been steam engines around since 1698. Um, you could well, if you've had the Royal Navy investing, you know, you're looking at things like the Cornish steam engine, those sort of things that they they've been around for a long time. This this have been. Uh, they've been using various things since 1714 on that on that scenario, but yeah. Uh, you could well see steam-powered warships with iron and teak hulls in service for the Battle of Trafalgar. Uh, the Battle of Trafalgar might be a sh group of ships, especially on the British side, because the British have the infrastructure and industry to do it, whereas the French keep having lots of sessions of killing each other. Um, and the Spanish also could have got there too, but they have slightly less of an advantage when it comes to steam technology than the British. Uh, slightly more issues with implementing that uh, due to their own internal infrastructure and the realities of their government structure. Um, so, yeah, th th that could well have been a load of warrior-style vessels. Probably, if in that kind of scenario, they might even be double-decked. So it might be two-deck, a two-gun-deck warrior-style vessels. <sighs> Interesting thing is whether they'd be paddle steamers or propeller-driven Probably due to casting tech, I'm reckoning paddle steamers. I, I, I don't think you'd have a first rate. My good, you have to remember the difference is first rate size vessels, you're talking about something being built up high. You only, what you need is this length, and that's another reason why you want the iron involved and other things involved in structure. Um, next trick, what would large caliber autoloaders, battleship guns, be able to reload at more angles of elevation? <coughs> or also only at one position, like manual parallel loaded. Um, look, it's not usually at one position, it's usually they can only they can load on a maximum degree. So basically your manual can load maybe up to sort of at this level. Um autoloader might be higher if you're prepared to put the weight and give it the distance to get up to that level, but it might also be the same. It's gonna be entirely dependent on the design. And remember, if a radar equipped, that's a 21 inch gunned battleship, goes against the Royal Navy instead of Bismarck, how much more or less does damage to the Royal Navy suffer? Um, if the. Okay. So here's your scenario. So you've built. The Germans have managed to build a 21 inch gunned battleship. And you're saying the Royal Navy's built the same ships they did historically? Or is the Royal Navy built to counter it? Because if the Germans are building something that big, a radar equipped, well, they're battleships with radar equipped anyway, so that doesn't, that's neither here nor there. Um, it's the 21 inch guns. 
If the Germans are building something which has got 21-inch guns, the British will not be at 14-inch guns. Um, what the British will be building, that the, that is entirely interesting. Because the, for the Germans to have a 21-inch gun ship, they're going to start work in 1935. So that means the British are going to definitely know in 1937 what they're building. Um, the British might have trouble with intelligence in Japan. They do not have trouble with intelligence in Germany. The British had that place pretty well covered. There's a reason for quite a lot of the stuff in World War II when it's, to be honest, the British have, are, are fairly good at getting information out of Germany. Um, I, I don't think there's really any contention over that because the British have been watching them closely since well before World War One, and have embedded some people in their structures since before World War One. Now, so if they build a 21-inch gunship, how many guns has it got? How big is it going to be? It's going to be bigger. The nicest way for them to build that, they're going to have to build up their infrastructure to build it. So they're going to have to absolutely telegraph their punches. So let's say it's got six guns, because that's the smallest size you can build and still have a useful armament. Um, you're talking something the size of incomparable. Uh, as was put up. In which case, it's going to be seen come. It's going to be seen coming in terms of construction time a long way off. Uh, for the British to ramp up their infrastructure to build equivalents, they will do so. Do I think they build a twenty-one inch gun the ship? No. Do I think they maybe build something with, I don't know, sixteen sixteen inch guns potentially? Um, it'll just be a radar armed. They might go with something with twelve sixteen inch guns. They're going to build a lot of them. If the Germans are building it to be a fast ship, i.e. a 30 knot, 31 knot ship, the British will build to counter that and will build a 30 to 31 knot ship that can do that as well. But the thing is, there are two things which are going to affect that scenario. One, there is no way on earth that uh, that Churchill orders a capital ship pause if that is what the Germans have coming down the line. No way he orders those capital ships pause and probably not the carriers as well because you're not pausing the capital ships, definitely not pausing the carriers. If those aren't paused, then how do the British deal with the Battle of Denmark with the Germans having that out? It'll be much the same. It'll be carrier strikes and to and weight of fire. Do they build necessarily a 21-inch gunship to kind of... That, and no, because then they'd have to develop it, all the tech and etc. That might not be possible in time. But they can go... Probably they can get definitely get a 16-inch, possibly a 16.5-inch gun. Um, they might well go with a 16.5-inch gun and might go with 12 those. Because honestly, that's going to be the escalator clause for everyone. Honestly, if the Germans are building that, it's going to become far, be spotted far enough down the line, it's going to be a colossal escalator clause for everyone. The Japanese at that point would have been able to announce that we're building an 18-inch gun battleship, and no one would be able to object to it, because the Germans are building a 21-inch gunship. But there's also the ceremony that they start in 1935, and France rolls across the border. They start that research and France just rolls across the border, which in 1935-36 they can do. Let's be honest, the German military in 1935-36 is a joke. You can roll across the border. Poland can roll across the border. There are lots of powers who could literally roll across the border in 35-36. Czechoslovakia probably could roll across the border in 1935-36. And the British would probably happily pay them to do it so they wouldn't have to deal with it. And you know how the British like to fight land wars in Europe? By hiring other people to do it. Take care, Tanif. Hope your headache gets better. When do you find it hard to think up questions for the recorded videos? I don't tend to find it hard. The more problem I have is that I have a lot more questions to answer than I actually have time to do record videos. 
Uh, that's my big problem. I have a lot more topics which I've researched and would like to write papers on and books on than I have time to write. I have a lot more questions. Basically, if I could do YouTube and writing full time as the only thing I earned income, and I know I'm doing that while I'm moving house, but if I could do that when I'm not moving house and do that as my only income, TV work as well, because that's useful for promoting everything. Um, I could probably double my written output. In terms of work, if I want, uh, could I double my video output? Well, I already put out a recorded video on Tuesdays, all Tuesdays, all Fridays, and all Saturdays, a live on Thursdays and Sundays. And I sometimes put out a recorded video on a Wednesday. And let's be honest, the Monday video slot is full, filled by the um, Twitch streams. I could probably up that as well. But that would be um, a, to, a, to a guaranteed video on a Wednesday. But yeah, there's, that would just... That, 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 wouldn't affect, that, that would cut a bit into writing time. I don't know, but that's to an extent some of my longer term planning and hoping is if, honestly, if move to Cornwall it proves out economic enough and if I can work everything else out enough, then hopefully I can do more writing and I can get more books published. But the trouble is, again, the hell up with books isn't the writing of books or the researching books or the ideas of books, it's the money for picture sort of books and licenses to produce them. Um, Black Maximus, um, August 1914, 418-inch Mark 40, uh, 48, uh, 18-inch 48 cal Mark 1 guns and 100,000 shells appear in Thames Ironworks. Uh, what did the British do on them? Party. Um, build battleships that can take them. You've got all those guns, you've got all those shells... You've got them to work and proof them. You build ships to take them. So some might be monitors get them, but probably also some battleships get build them. And how many of those battleships are going to get? Who knows? It might it's probably going to be eight gun systems by like like the um. You got four hundred eighteen shells. If you think about it, eight, uh, you can uh, eight guns. That's 25 battleships worth low, uh, 25 cavalry ships with 8 guns apiece. Um, you probably, I decide to go for at least 16. And then the rest are spares for refits of those things and for some monitors. Because you could build 16, sh uh, 16 ships instead of the 25. That gives, you ni that gives you 9 times 8, which is 72 left over. Let's say use another 8... For monitors, that's four monitors armed with uh, that, those guns, and that leaves you with 64 for spares and rolling through and changeovers. So basically, you can change over eight of the sh uh, eight, uh, full squadron of the battleships, but that's two squadrons of battleships. Additional time might well go into some of the quality, yeah, but I. I the quality isn't as bad as it... Okay, let's be honest. I think I've come a long way from the original... I was looking at some of the older videos, older lives, where I was holding up the, the, the placards, etc. I think the quality's come a bit, a bit since then. What tonnage is needed to get the King Draws up to four quad 14-inch guns, but with the same speed and armor? Um, probably up them to about 45,000 tons. 45, uh, 50,000 uh, 45, tons. It's going to depend on hull shaping to an extent. 45,000 tons standard probably is uh, what you're heading up to. Glad to hear the audio quality is improved. Uh, anyway, I could generally deceive your own navy by building 11 11-inch guns and only receiving 41 in centimeter after the building uh, and launching ships. No. 
Um, the turrets, etc., are added on the fitting out yards, but honestly, you can A, tell from the size of the barbettes what guns are going in them, and the size of the hulls. Uh, you can tell to extent how massive, and they could maybe pretending they're going to carry a lot of 11 inch guns, but you think about it. To take up the equivalent space, and broad space space, so when they're going from three 11 inch guns, they go down to twin 15 inch guns. You're going down to if you're going to 45, 50 uh, to 53 centimeter guns. Think about how big a gun that is. Uh, 11 inch ones are well, 11 times 25. That's 275, roughly. Plus type four, so it's roughly 280. You're going up to 530. You're going to almost uh, to another 25. 250 centimeters on, or 250 millimeters, right? 250 millimeters on, or greater. What are you exclaiming you're doing? You're building a quad turret of 11 inch guns? And you're then going to fit twin? Okay, you can do, you, you could try and fake that through. But there you've got all the foundries, you've got all the big areas of testing, the big infrastructure industry. And you've got the fact that you've got to build, a uh, build and acquire all the tools necessary to do that, and all the knowledge necessary to do it. You're going to create a lot of noise doing it. There's a reason why the British know the details they do about the Bismarck, the tur uh, Turpits. They know the details about the Shan Horse, etc. It's because the Germans are having to make a lot of noise to do the development they are doing. So I don't think there's any way they could deceive it. Uh, and it will take a lot of time. 80, 20 rules and such. Mm. I find that strange because in audio terms... Hmm. It's on its maximum. It's on its... It's all there. Not sure if that's any improvement. That's an improvement, do say. I want some iron bro. I've only got four bottles left. I'll run out before Thursday at this rate. It's terrible. Terrible. Woe is me. Short of iron brew. Hmm. <sighs> I'm gonna be glad when I'm sort of... It, it, it's gonna sound strange, and this one is a personal comment, and I know I'm British and we like to complain a lot, but this is a point I'm gonna make. So, as you all know, I haven't for the last few weeks, well, uh, actually a couple of months almost, been doing much in the way of other work other than YouTube and occasionally some TV stuff and um, writing and sorting out and moving in the house because of the fact I need to focus on that to get that done. But I was supposed to receive a paycheck on Friday, one of the last ones from one of the academic works I did before Christmas. It's late. They had, like, they had, because of the way it's structured pay, it was not supposed to come through till, till um, April. That's fine. I don't mind that. It's okay. It's nearly four months after I've done the work, but that's fine. Okay, that's fine. You, 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 you pay, you, that's, that, that's the pay cycle. I'm expecting it. Even with four months head, head, uh, heads up, they still couldn't pay me on time. And they've now told me it might be up to as many as two weeks late. Miss living near Drac. Um, that's going to be the biggest gap because I'm going to miss the ship shape, guys. It's it's funny we don't see each other that much when we're not on our trips, but it's nice knowing they're there. And if you consider moving the house, I've had issues and I needed extra muscle, and they've been here without a question, without a demur. They literally, I call them, they're here, and. Um, 
yeah, in Cornwall I'll have family. Yeah, I'll have all sorts of weird things to, uh, that are, are, are sort of are roots. But it's nice having friends who you know. If they call you, you're there. If you call them, they're there. It's it's fun. That's called a snuff officer. Yeah, yeah there, there are many things. Plan masters, U.S. enlarged the Panama locks in 90 minutes. How would, could this change U.S. ship design in 30s and 40s? They could have gone bigger. Uh, if Let's put it this way. The big interesting thing is if they didn't have to make the bows as they could make the ships longer uh, in t and, and longer, and so they didn't have to make them so quite so narrow at the end for the Iowas, because the Iowas are re that's a really worrying bow. At the end, so they could have they could have made some big improvements to stability and ride for them. Um, luckily, as there is the cheapest, they're three pound for two bottles, one pound eighty five a bottle, or three pound for two bottles for Iron Brew. But last week when I went in there, they only had five bottles left. Only five balls, and so I could only buy five. And so instead of getting them all for one pound fifty a bottle, I had to pay one pound eighty five for one bottle. It's just terrible. And they're two liters. Bruno, briefly, what would the impact be if all the battleships in the combat nations of World War Two started their wars with the maximum pre-war plan modernizations completed? So, all the Queen Elizabeth class are at the level of war spite. All the R class are at the level of Royal Oak. Repulse and Renown are modernized. Hood modernized. All the American ship standards are, that were going to be modernized. Which is very few, but there was a couple in the May. They were planning on doing some modernization, so it had been done. So all of them have been modernized. The impact... The British now have five frontline Queen Elizabeth class vessels, which is going to mean they're going to take the bulk of the work in the Mediterranean still, but they've now got five of them. So that probably means Malaya and Bar uh, Malaya and Barham don't get used for uh, the escort work, and Malaya especially doesn't get used for the escort work she, work she does historically. She's probably going to be using used for battle work. Um, the R's all upgraded to the same standard Royal Oak. That's going to give them far, far better fire control. Still probably going to be used for the same missions. But I even less likely do I want to run in one if I'm a Sharnhorst. Um, Repulse and Renown at the same modifications. That That's going to give Repulse an interesting combat history. Because suddenly she becomes a very useful fast ship. And that's going to take some of the pressure off Hood and Renown. Uh, Hood and Renown, Hood fully modernised. That's going to be a bad day for someone at the office. Because that's going to change her weaknesses. She's still going to have the trough in the same position, but it's going to change her weaknesses. And it's going to move things around, so she might not suffer the same loss... Um, big changes, not really much. Little changes, a lot of them. A lot of context changes. A lot of nuance changes. Uh, Japanese fleet, they're concentrating. They're concentrating so much on Yamato, Mushashi, Shinano, and the other of that class's battleships that, no, they're not really doing much in the way of upgrades. Italy's done all its upgrades by that point, so that do not count. Germany has nothing to upgrade. So it's only really the British and Americans which change much. The French, goodness knows me. Goodness gracious me, they're not getting anywhere. Um, so yeah, it's, it, the big changes it's going to make are survivability of British capital ships, their ability to deal with air attack, 
and their ability to operate in 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 full fighting scenarios. It's going to maybe mean that you have uh, where you have battles. You know, if you consider Matapan, where they have three capital ships there and formidable, they might have a fourth. Um, there are all sorts of options. Barham also might not be. We consider well, Barham. She sunk in November 1941 by U331. If she'd been. If she'd been fully reconstructed, unlike War Spite, Valiant, and Queen Elizabeth, so she was relatively minor changes. Um, so that would include better anti anti submarine protection, which means she might not have been sunk by the torpedo that hit her. Because basically, U331's torpedo hit her magazine pretty much. Because yeah, she's basically considering the angle she's hit by the torpedoes. Barham might not have been lost. If Barham's not lost, that's interesting. But basically, that gives the British five modernised Queen Elizabeths. So you all see what War Spike gets up to in the war, and you see what Queen Elizabeth and Valiant do. So when Queen Elizabeth and Valiant get damaged, it's just War Spike on her own, who's basically the left as the, the thing. So maybe, in the nicest way, you might end up with one of those ships also being out with War Spite. So let's say it's War Spite and Malaya are out there. as And also, in a nice way, again, do you send Prince of Wales and Repulse? And do you send maybe a, a one of the, a, one of the Queen Elizabeths with them? Um, that's all the scenarios you can have. It, it's going to change things. It might be that you send out a couple of Queen, mod of, uh, and, uh, Queen Elizabeths rather than uh, Repulse and uh, Prince of Wales, because they're modernized vessels. You might not, but it also might mean that the Indian Ocean Fleet is built around War Spite and another Queen Elizabeth class, modernized Queen Elizabeth, and in which case, how does that affect how he plays it? Because if Somerville has two modernized Queen Elizabeths, he might well be far keen on risking a fight with any Japanese force than he should do. Oh, the Cornwall shots already have plenty of iron brew. <laughs> Thomas, is there a bet between you and Drac on Atreus card Argent Core would have been armed with? Um, I think there is a meal running on it from memory. I'm sure he'll he'll remind me if I if I am not wrong. Um, Black Marcus, what if there was an island side of Corsica in the middle of the North Sea? How would that change things, and who is likely to end up owning it by the time of the 20th century? The UK. It would be the UK or Norway, and it would be the UK. That would be one of the most fought over islands in the world, and it would be the UK. It would have been fought over by Denmark, it would have been part of Denmark, Norway, all sorts of places, people. The British would have occupied it at some point due to not uh, due to Denmark's 
relationship with um, France and probably very sure would have kept it. If it's the size of Corsica, it's a fairly decent sized island in the middle of the North Sea. Um, the British would own it. You know, it, it's a 3,368 square mile island. Yeah, that that's a plenty of space. It's today. It, uh, of course, it's got a sports population of nearly over 350,000. Um, yeah, uh, you are... You're going to want that if it's the middle of the North Sea. Probably would have still had the mountains and various things down it, but it would be fun. It would also probably have been a major naval base. And if you think about the, let's say, World War One, the British might well have set the fleet up there and be doing a distant blockade from there. So that's going to push everything closer to Germany, but it's also going to make it far less likely for the Germans to be able to go behind that island and do a raid on, let's say, Hartlepool or Scarborough. Because you do that, the British base is right between you and them. Nice thing. Question 41. Other than better AA guns, what would you expect to be the difference about Yamato if she was built by the British? Well, not so much better AA guns, but, you know, the British would prefer to have more guns, but they'd be the same calibre and dual purpose. Now, it's not so much better AA guns as that amounts to better AA coverage, and that gives you um, the ability to be more sustain uh, sustainable uh, in terms of your firing. If she were built by the British... Honestly, I expect it to be slightly shorter. Um, I'd like, I expect it to be slightly squatter. And faster. The British would not settle for 27 knots. That's far too close to 28 knots and not achieving fast battleship speed. They go for 28 knots. If the Royal Canadian Navy bought three York heavy cruisers, oh good lord, two RFUs of light cruisers and well, basically for them to buy all that, what would have to change in the Canada's government to buy this? They'd have to change government. You'd have to have a complete another different view of naval strength, and they'd actually have to be keen on having it. So yeah, that. It was also would have to be fun to be worked out with the treaty limits. But, yeah, you know. If they bought it prior to 1930, it could be done. Or rather, uh, it could be done. I have no idea why they're buying so few. I have no idea why they're buying 8A, 1C, 4E, 4G, 3H class. Um... I, I, as in a nice way, they'd probably they'd probably buy them in a flotilla, so it would be eight A's and a flotilla leader. If they're buying E's and G's, they'd buy four and four and a flotilla leader. If they're buying H class, they'd buy four and a flotilla uh, four and then four or something else and a flotilla leader. But you've got them buying four G's and four H's, you know that and a flotilla leader. You you don't buy ones and fours of destroyers. You buy them in flotillas. So, E and F stayed worked together, or C and D's worked together as a flotilla, G and H's worked together as a flotilla, and you want a flotilla leader. So that's what they'd be buying them in at the time. They wouldn't just be buying an individual destroyer. No one buys one destroyer, unless you're a really, really small, really, really pathetic country. And that's all you can afford. And even then, you buy one this year, you buy three more at the same time next year. Or you keep buying them in ones. Uh, Henry Rofer, if a uh, 62,000 metric ton, 31 knot, with four um, single airship did the business run, how much damage would the iron take, presuming the historic fleet? 
It's got four single guns. Or they take less damage. And I can tell you why. Rate of fire of those gun that gun will be very slow. Its salvo ability will be negligible with only four single mounts. Um, so it actually hitting a target would be a fun thing. So honestly, it would have that weight. It would have that speed. But the thing is, the reality is, the rate of fire of, I don't know, Hood or any of the ships when it gets in range of them would be astronomical compared to it. So basically, it has four single guns. That's no help. There's a reason why the minimum tonnage I was talking about was six guns in three pairs. Because that gives you the ability to do the salvo and the ranging fire. And even that's going to be interesting with the rate of fire you're going to have for that size gun. You, it, it's not a good scenario. Let's say everyone, you might have discount, but they're not going to set out to buy to get the second-hand ships. They're not going to they're going to set out to, if they're buying them, they're buying them new. They're, the reason they bought tribals, etc. They're not buying them with the knowledge they're going to get the second-hand ships. The second-hand ships they get because that's what the Royal Navy has available and is prepared to give them. That's a very different scenario than we're setting out to buy them. As uh, Sharon. A uh, bit of an old, old scenario, scenario. Victoria's sons all proceed to see, sir. I'm not changing Victoria's date of birth. What the British crown landing on the head of Kaiser Wilhelm lead to? Uh, it wouldn't get to Kaiser Wilhelm. Um. <clears throat> now, Queen Victoria dies in 1901 George the 6th George the 5th was born in 8 in 1865 Edward of Duke of Edward um, Prince Edward of York, i. Edward the Eighth, is born in 1894. So for Kaiser Wilhelm to succeed Queen Victoria, you have to kill off not only all her sons, you have to kill off all their sons, and all their sons' sons, for him to succeed her. Even then, he wouldn't succeed her. Because he's the the German head of state. He might want to claim the throne, but at this point you've gone for enough people have died, the British Parliament are involved. And honestly As much as she loves Victoria, um, her eldest daughter, I think you probably have Princess Alice's issue be the ones they go for. And Princess Alice of the United Kingdom um, was married, of course, to Louis IV. And her eldest son let's see, it was Grand uh, wife of uh, her eldest son She died already. Her eldest son is Louis, Grand Duke of Hesse by the Rhine. Mm-hmm. And honestly, there's our option in that there's the good old Louis himself. As in... The Louis who I was talking about the other day for the, you know, it as the British, uh, as a first sea lord.
Um, it's not worried. There's, there's no, there's no worry in misremembering. Um, British succession does work by primogenitor, but it's a case of if you're dealing with that many dying, then it's usually Parliament gets involved and starts inviting people. He is so, Kaiser Wilhelm is so far down the list. It's not even funny. He often thinks he's in high up the list. He thinks he's her best, her favorite grandson, and all these things. But there's all sorts of people between him and the royal, him and the throne. Uh, basically, there's a there's a good uh, there's a good chance that if Queen Victoria dies without issue, that the person who becomes King of the UK, under that circumstance, is the gentleman who was born in. Well, the, it is a more chance of this gentleman becoming it than her, uh, than him, because. Yeah. It could well be Louis Mountbatten. Louis of Battenberg, the guy who becomes first Sea Lord. He could, he has a he has such a chance. He's the uh, Victoria. Da, 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 they'd go through him, and he's a naturalized British citizen, and he's serving in the Royal Navy, and he's uh, he's dedic it's the nicest way they could well go with him. So that could end up with Prince Philip becoming our future king. Yeah, uh, there's also the fact that Louis Mountbatten might be involved, but actually Louis Mountbatten would not be involved because if you consider the thing is that sort of uh, you um when you go for it, you have to remember um it's George Mountbatten who's actually the eldest son and is the actual heir. That's one of the problems with Louis Mountbatten. He's always trying to disprove that is um disprove his his elder brother is not better than him. Um, if I give you an example of George Mountbatten, who was the second Marquis of Milford Haven, and... A very nice gentleman, by all accounts. Um, he was... Someone who could work out gunnery, complicated gunnery problems in his head and read books on calculus uh, tra casually on the trains. Those are quotes about him. He's basically, to an extent, the British equivalent of Ching Li in, some, in, in contemporary, in contemporary skill sets. Um, he would certainly have been similar to that. He's one of the people who is, um, how do I put this politely, got rid of by the Geed's Axe. Uh, theoretically, he retires on own request in 1932, but, yeah, he dies in 1938, and it's succeeded by David Michael Mountbatten, who lived till 1970, and... Think that is that the current? Yeah, the current. It's currently we're up to the fourth Marquis of Milford Haven, who is uh, George Ivor Louis Mountbatten. Uh, yeah, basically, it's a sort of foster father of Prince Philip, but Prince Philip is also connected to the family via other means, so there's all sorts of connections going on there. 
Uh, no, there's no evidence I have of Cut Lee meeting Cunningham or Henderson. So, a bit of a uh, answer to that one. Um, but, yeah, the answer, there is no circumstance where Kaiser ends up becoming uh, the... Um, Head of the the British monarch of Britain because the scenario the British government and a lot of British politicians work out quite quickly is he is unsuited by temperament to the nature of a constitutional monarchy. He couldn't deal with it, and the British wouldn't want to become a republic at that time, despite what my ultimate Admiral Dreadnought's campaign has done. I mean, you would massively change the outcome of Jutland or end up being called the Admirals by staff at the insane island you're all confined in. Uh, the reality is, if we were pushed back in time and suddenly replaced him in post, and so for, and uh, by such a means that we retained in charge, so we either presented as them or everyone remembered us to be them, and we had the knowledge necessary to be able to act as them, um, as well as our own knowledge, which we probably actually do, but, you know, we need some possible help with. Um, do you think I'd go around telling everyone I'm from the future? No, I don't think Drac would either. We just have some very interesting ideas and show that they worked. And prod people, i.e. engineers, etc. forward. And, you know, generally push our weight around a bit. And over, in Sharnall's 41 centimetre gun version, I meant to build 283 centimetre guns, but buy four buy four hundred and ten millimetre guns from Japan and not advertise the size of the intended gun size. Um so you want to change the eleven inch to sixteen inch guns. That's still a jump. Okay, may you, it's not quite the same jump. Maybe you can get two of those in the same spot as you got the three eleven inch, but um, you're gonna in the nicest way. How are you getting those guns from Japan? By ship. That means they're gonna have to go through German docks and Japanese docks, plus be on the ships for all that way round the world. Maybe they go through the Suez Canal. Perhaps they go round Africa. Who knows? But that's going to be a long time at sea. And there's all sorts of information going backwards and forwards and payments being made. And all sorts of systems going up which are going to raise flags which are going to lead to investigations. So yes, they're going to spot them. Uh, if, that, that, if the Germans are then sneaking them onto the ships at that point... That causes a problem, but if they're 16 inch guns, that's fine because the modifications done to the King George V was designed to deal with 16 inch gun ships. That's what they were modified to. That's one of the reasons why they drop um, down from 10 to, from four, uh, 12 to 14 to 10 guns. Um, honestly, it's the idea is you're, you're putting in extra armor and extra subdivision. And you're kind to keep it under the treaty limits, and it's only when the treaties go boom, oh, well, the treaties are over. Okay. You realise, hang on, we didn't need to do that. Um, so I don't, I don't think they end up with six, gu six, 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 six inch guns. If a, a 10, 14 inch gun ship can deal with that, um, what else do the British do? Probably accelerate the Lion class. Uh, that's about it. The Lion class design will be finalised and being pushed through. At an accelerated rate. I said, so in a non-treaty, uh, non-treaty, would be right to expect the actual Amazon Amazigade would be the step between the thousand plus to fifteen hundred plus ton WV and V classes rise to the next generous rise. Mm, probably.
not so much what the extra bottles I were all in the uh, Yarrow and Yedish was. About 40 bottles when I left the Yedish. <sighs> Cruelty. Henry River, increase of war if Iron Brew donated funds for construction of a replenishment ship. Atrus Iron Brew, rate name, of, <laughs> rate name out of 10. <laughs> Ooh, Iron Brew. She'd be a bra ship. Let's be honest, the only thing scary would be the HMS Baked Beans, because that thing would terrorise the Italians. Is she firing shells or baked beans at us? That's a war crime! HMS Smalley. I have loaded up, sir. Are we firing shells at the Italians? No, sir, we ran out of those. What are we firing at the Italians? Baked beans. Good luck. It wouldn't. Amber would not be a replenishment ship. She'd be a warship. That's quite. She's got to be a warship. Uh, and I said in front. So why are canister carriers easier to muck around with by binning the treaty compared to the battleships? Um, you think about the construction of a carrier, which is basically a hull. You've got all the stuff underneath and the stuff on top. And think about the battleship. Where are you building the armor plate? Where are you putting the guns? How many decks do the guns go through? How much weight is the guns? How look at long lead items? What are long lead items on a carrier? There are engines. Long lead items on a ca on a battleship. You've got the guns. You've got the ammunition hoist. You've got the turrets. You've got the engines. Battleships far more difficult to muck around with in a in a treaty dissolving world than but carriers because of the long lead items and all the other stuff. Thank you, Blackbear Maximus. HMS Marmite. Some people would love her, some people would hate her, but all would fear her. My most Battle of Jutland, sixteen hundred hours. All British capital ships turn into small tube, uh, small tube boiled fast Queen Elizabeth battleships. Can the Germans get away? <sighs> all the British capital ships, so all the battle cruisers and all the battleships turn into twenty-eight knot Queen Elizabeth class battle uh, ships with eight, eight fifteen-inch guns. No, the Germans can't get away, and in that scenario, they might get massacred. Honestly, that scenario, that, that's not good for the Germans, because that means every single... It's not just the 15-inch guns, it's not just the speed that they can move at. It's, more importantly, it's going to be the fire control systems, because the Queen Elizabeth class had probably the best fire control of any battleship the Royal Navy had at the time in service, other than the R's. So if they're all upgraded to that, then the fire control is going to go through the roof, and the war fighting capabilities are going to be, oh, good lord, and the 15 inch shells hitting. Uh, let's be honest, even a 15 inch shell, which doesn't necessarily work properly, it hitting is still a significant emotional event. So all those 11 inch, all those 12 inch hits, all those 13 and a half inch ships are now hits are now 15 inch shells hitting. In fact, probably more of them because they're going to be more accurate weapons to fire them. So yeah, um. I, I think that's a very bad scenario for the Germans. I'm not sure if it's a complete annihilation of the High Seas Fleet, but I think it could well be a loss of High Seas Fleet ships lost. Take the historical number of ships which are severely damaged, then just turn them into sunks. And you won't lose vessels like the Invincible class, because th that ship is not going down to the same level... Of, the Queen Elizabeth class is not going down to the same level of fire. Look at what Warspite takes. While doing her donuts. Um, so yeah, that, that's not happening. Okay, guys, but speaking of 53 uh, centimeter guns, uh, how, what about main gun bore with L42 50 caliber? Would post 1910 days ago go with 8 inch or uh, bigger secondaries? 8 inch or bigger secondaries? If I've got an 8 inch secondary, then I'm at least looking for something of an 18, 20 inch gun. 
at least. Um, if I'm being sensible. But realistically, an 8-inch secondary? Why do I want that? Well, what's it going to be good for? Is it going to invade? It's not going to be fast enough firing to engage destroyers. And it's whilst it's going to be accurate enough to hit things like mm, cruisers, etc., it, it's not really much enough of an advantage over a 6-inch. Um, anyway, to my knowledge, I've heard this before. Some of the thickest armor plating in the of low quality. I have heard that assessment before. I find that very interesting to say, considering, well, neither Yamato or Mashashi, to my knowledge, have been done enough testing on them since they've been sunk, because of where they've sunk, um, or despite just having discovered the wreck, to really work out whether they are low quality or not. So, whilst I do respect some people who do make things of, it could not have been solid inside, it, the, um, uh, the armour could not have been... I, I think that comes from the same group who always presume that anything which is not done by um, people who are of... Let, let me put it this way. I'd ask them, if the Germans had told you that their battleship on... Bi uh, that the Bismarck's armour was that thick and worked, would you believe them? If your answer to that is yes, and they have less experience building battleships and less ongoing experience in infrastructure than the Japanese do, and your answer to Japanese is they wouldn't be viable, then what you are is uh, a verbu. Um, so what I would say is I wouldn't classify it necessarily as low quality. I wouldn't do that. And, and until we've done a lot of testing, we can actually sustain and prove if it was low quality or not. I don't, wouldn't accept, accept that. But I would say the thickest armour the British are looking at building and are working out the ideas of building is about 16 inches thick. And the British are very confident on their quality and ability to build a quality, build 16 inch thick. They haven't looked at building anything bigger, but that's because the British design proportions the size of guns they think they're going to be using. So when they think they're going to be facing 16 inch guns, they're looking at 14 inch roughly. Or rather, the British think in terms of weight of armour. So the British think in terms of pounds per uh, pounds per sort of square area of armour, um, and that works out at roughly fourteen point seven inches, roughly. But they do sometimes have thicker armour, sometimes thinner, slightly thinner armour. Um, it's roughly the same with the Americans, honestly. But that's because that's what most of them are thinking about building up to the thickness of. They haven't really pushed it further. The Japanese push it further because of what they're building. You have to remember, they are building these ships because of their desire to make them able to fight, uh, to outmatch. Uh, well, basically, the idea is that they'll be able to sink one while fighting off a second. So they can deal with some of the number issues the Japanese have versus facing the larger American fleet. That's their idea. So, yeah, they're putting everything into armor and those guns. That's what they're putting the money into. Um, I believe the terminology is it was lower quality than Royal Navy armor. That could have been, but there again, the Royal Navy armor, in, especially put under the King George V, is probably mm, better than pretty much anyone else in the world. I'd argue your two best armor manufacturers in the world this time are Britain and America. And the reason is because they have the most practice keep doing it, and they keep testing it and building it. It's kind of like the British have an unfair advantage when it comes to torpedoes, because they build so many and they test so many. The Americans are the are sort of to extent similar when it comes to armor. They don't they do far more testing on their armor than they do on their um on our things. So this is this the reality you're dealing with.
Actually, that's a challenge to the chat. Which names of food names would make for the best battleships and which for the best destroyers and best cruisers? So you've got to think about a name which is not good. good is what name is good for a battleship or food? What name is good for a cruiser for food or from food? And what name is good for a destroyer from food? And I'll add in a bonus, submarines. And you can't just go with subway because that's just cheating for a submarine. Or foot long either. Because that's just being cruel to a submarine. <laughs> but I'm honest, what if the Romanovs have been saved and relocated to say Canada or Australia? How would this change things? Oh good lord, they'd be caught they be cause celeb during the Cold War. I mean literally everyone be courting them. They probably end up married to wealthy Russian, a uh, well, a wealthy American businessman, something like that. Um, in terms of the daughters, um, to try and get the best care for the uh, for the brother, and you know they'd probably be just the member. Or they'd probably like quite a lot of royal families over the years. They'd have disappeared into the menage that is the global, ever seems to be circulating, always partying group. Of socialites. Um, yeah, I, I would say there's a difference between calling it low quality and saying lower quality. And that was the that's the thing. Once you call it something low quality. That suggests it's not good armor. It's good armor. It's maybe not the same quality as some of the American and British built armor. But again, it's not going to be bad armor. The Japanese have been building armor for a long time. They've done a lot of metallurgical work. They have a lot of experience in metallurgy. A lot of time compensating for the um, quality of much of the armor they can get. Armor they can get. Remember, there's a whole discussion over the swords and when it comes to spring steel, etc. So... The reality is, you should never you should never write off Japanese metallurgical skills and knowledge. Bang Christmas. Henderson lives to the age of ninety. How does it change things? He's alive to have an argument with Churchill over pausing carrier and capital ship construction. In which case, that would be an interesting fight to watch. He probably wins the fight and then gets packed off to the Far East because Churchill wants him as far away from him as possible. In which case, he's in charge of repairing the Royal Navy and the Far East forces for the Far East. For war with Japan. And is probably still in charge and probably sent ships rather than Tom Phillips being sent out there when it comes to, Rena uh, when it comes to Princess of Wales and Repulse. Although, considering there's going to be more carriers in service because they're not going to be paused, there's going to be more capital ships in service because they weren't paused, um, he probably gets a carrier as well. And then, well, he gets to play all sorts of games. Um, if you have enough carriers also built early enough, then who knows what's happened to the Italians at Toronto, what's happened vis-a-vis -vis to Bismarck, because let's be honest, if you had a couple of carriers around, uh, then Bismarck, uh, instead of... Prince of Wales and Hood being just them, they'd probably have a carrier with them. There's probably another, at least another fast capital ship. There might have been enough capital ships in service that Hood's actually gone off to be um, maintained. So it might be you've got King George V, Prince of Wales, and a carrier hunting down Hood, uh, hunting down Bismarck, and another group made up of I don't know Duke of York and Anson, and another carrier. And that would be the format. Those would be the formations hunting Bismarck. In which case, Bismarck ends up in a fight with two fast battleships, and that yes, ain't gonna be good for it. Um, the, the, so much parts of history change with that scenario; it becomes in almost obscene. The one thing you might see also done is you might well see the orders placed for the flower class and the hunt class escort destroyers placed earlier. They might be managed. He might manage to push them through at the end of 1938 rather than after after the financial settlement in 1939. 
in which case the order of the ships could well be on construction and might even be entering service. If they're ordered six months earlier, then that's going to change their entry into service dramatically. And that's going to change the Battle Atlantic. Nice everyone. Question 37. The US stops after the stuff it built before watching Nail Treaty and the earthquake stops Japan's building. Wouldn't that give ammunition to the people who want to cut naval spending? No. It can, but it also might. It also probably won't. You see, if the Americans start... Uh, did, uh, uh, this is going to sound strange. When the British are building the G freeze and the N freeze, are they talking about relation to anyone else? No. They are modernizing their fleet. And they're going to modernize their fleet at their pace. The thing is, your thing, and naval spending might be recre uh, decreased. It probably will be decreased. That's not going to pause naval construction. Go back to the 1890s. Go back to the 1880s. Go back to the 1870s. What is there a constant stream of? The British producing ships, which will be battleships and cruisers and destroy, and uh, what eventually so the ships which become sort of version destroyers. The, the scenario you're dealing with is whether there would be a pause in construction. No. Would the fleet go massively in size? No. Would the fleet maybe reduce slightly in size? Potentially. Would the fleet say probably say broadly the same? Yes. Would there be a reserve fleet left in ordinary? I am very... Uh, very uh, I would presume so. I reckon the Royal Navy would be aiming for a force of roughly um, two squadrons of battleships in full service, so that's 16, and eight in reserve. And they'd probably be aiming for four battle cruisers in certain regular and four in reserve. So for, they'd have 12 ships in ordinary and about 24, uh, well, about 20 ships in commission. That's what they'd be sort of aiming for, and that's what they'd sort of keep to. Because that fits with what they normally have. Because that would allow them to maintain a battle squadron for the Atlantic, fl or home, Atlantic and Home Fleet, a battle squadron for the Mediterranean Fleet, and some, uh, and some battle cruisers to be based in the eastern area. Jellico, when he's drawing up his plans post-World War I, is talking about a free fleet navy, which would be built around three battle squadrons. One in, the Medi one in the Indian Ocean, one in the Mediterranean, one in the Atlantic. That is not done with any relationship to looking at America, Japan, or anyone else. They are factors, but they're not the reasoning behind British numbering. It's literally, how do we protect the Empire? So, that is the real that is the scenario you're looking at. It's, my in my scenario, the British have saved money, they've put the battle cruisers in the, in the, as the core of the Eastern Fleet in Indian Ocean, They've got the battle squadron in the Mediterranean. They've got the battle squadron at home, and they've got a reserve battle. They've got a battle squadron in ordinary and another four battle cruisers. That 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 would be it. And honestly, what do I see those ships being? I see the fifteen-inch gun ships being the bulk, the bulk of the uh, eventually, uh, sorry, and eventually the ships as they get older pass down. So eventually, the fifteen-inch gun ships will be confined to the home fleet and squadron in ordinary. And it will be, you know, that that's how they'll do it. They'll work through the 16 and a half. But they'll slowly replace that. So you'd be talking about two ships every year coming into service, sort of. So they've got a constant build rate of roughly two, uh, roughly three years to build them. They're ordering a set every two years. Um, so they'd usually have, let's say, four under, uh, under construction, or four to six under construction in one time in various states of construction and commissioning. It's it's not going to be a massive expense for the British. It's going to be very easy for them to keep going with their infrastructure. Lots of fun coming on with the various uh, various foods. There was a swordfish, which was a submarine as well as a, as well as a aircraft. The Royal Navy does not is not precious over the names. I said, if the British were occupying a post-war Imperial Japan. What might they do differently from the Americanization that occurred? The British were occupied. There were British and Commonwealth forces, I think, involved in the occupation. Uh, they were fewer in number, and they weren't there as long. If the British had taken the lead, let's say the British... Admiral Henderson is out in the Far East, has a significant fleet, pushes himself up, and manages to humble Japan in some way, and then occupy it. 
um, the British difference to the American scenario. Um, the British are far more used to dealing with a royal, with a royal scenario. Um, they won't be swept away quite so much by the Emperor and some of the stuff which MacArthur gets involved in, but they're probably not going to be too different. It's probably not going to be that different, honestly, because you, you're you aiming for the same things and you've got similar tools at your disposal. Um, I don't really see how... If there are... In this scenario, if there are nine fast battleships of Queen Elizabeth style in that service, and the Royal Navy has, again, so if we go to the Washington Treaty Royal Navy. And we say, right then, they're the small tube boy, uh, ships, and let's say they're 20, let's round, round them to 28,000 tons. So that's 28,000 tons, and we're times nine. So that's that. Then we'd want. Times five. Um, do, 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 do. And we want those. Ba -da -da -da. So, yeah. Honestly, that doesn't affect things much because that still only gives the British 503,450 uh, total tons. And remember, they're supposed to be allowed 525,000 tons. But they're going to want to build those 16 inch gun ships as well. And they're not going to want to get rid of any 15 inch ships. They might be prepared to get rid of Tiger in that circumstance. Um, but. And that. Doesn't give them enough. So. Honestly, the thing is, you probably have the British fighting for a slightly bigger tonnage differential. differential. Um, equals that minus that over two. Um, if they make that 560. Um, yeah, pretty much the, the, the British would probably argue that they've got to have at least 16 ships under the treaty limitation. But that would be, that's what you're talking about in terms of standard displacement. Official declared standard displacement for the Queen Elizabeth class was 27,500 tons. Official declared, declared um, standard displacement for the Royal Sovereign class, for the Revenge class was 25,750 tons. So basically, I've to get into small true boilers, I upped them to 28,000 tons to give them a bit more room, and that's still plenty of space. So... Yeah, there's going to be a bit of a toing and froing. It's either going to be 16, 35,000 ton ships or. Or they have to make it, I don't know, 40,000 ton ships or maybe 37,000 ton. Could they make it with 37,000 tons? Uh, they could make them 37,000 ton ships in standard, or even... Yeah, 37,000 tons is the smallest they can get away with. If they, want 15, if they really want 15 ships as the limit, they're going to have to go with 37,000 tons to, get the, to allow the British to build um, Rodney and... Ren uh, Nelson and Rodney. Um, if... So that's that's their limitation. They either go for 15 times 37,000 or at least 16 times 35,000 tons to be able to get it through. 
basically you just change the treaty. Probably it's the 15 times 37,000 tons. And for the British, that's a really good deal. Because the British at that point then have 14, 15 inch gun battleships. And admittedly, they, they lose Tiger. But if they want to keep Tiger. If they want to keep Tiger, they have to they they'd have to get an agreement which was no more than that. Oh, we have to be fifteen thirty nine thousand ton ships. So if if they want to keep Tiger as well, they have to get thirty nine thousand. <laughs> but they either get three 15 inch gun battle they either get to include completely make their fleet 15 inch gun ships and they would have like 17 of them five r's nine queen elizabeths three uh, hood renown repulse and that's the 37000 ton limit or if they keep tiger as well then they have 39000 tons as the standard displacement limit and that's going to change things dramatically as well um, either way, the British end up with a lot more ships going into World War II, and that's a scary scenario for anyone, especially if you're Germany. Because the British end up with, yeah, that's, with that many fast battleships especially, 28 knot ships starting out with, it's very easy to maintain them at 28 knots, and that's... going to mean that Scharnhorst and Eisenau either have to be faster which means it's going to be other things changed in their design or mm -hmm. and if you've got nine of those now wandering around and let's say the British have modernised like six of them which they could have done and you know based on the scenario they modernised three and left two out, so that's basically 60%. So let's say they modernized six of them. That's a big difference again. And I was talking about when five modernized ships without 20 knots speed, that, that changed things. Well, with six modernized ships with 28 knots of speed, then you change, you've got you've got things going differently. Abazaski, if the treaties only put limits on capital ships in carrier construction, would the British go with seven and a half inch or nine point two inch as their heavy cruiser gun during the war? Let's say eleven inch plus is battleship in treaty. Oh, nine point two inch. Nine point two inch would be heavy gun. Um, that's that. There's no qualms about that. It was all based around the Hawkins class, which were large light cruisers. They weren't heavy cruisers. They were light cruisers. If Jordan had been a stomp and British should break into the Baltic, what route is the RN going to take to get into the Baltic? Um, well, pretty much it's... So, you have got... Pretty much... Uh, you, you've got to go through the Skagarak and then the Kadagak. And then you've got a choice in straits. And that's where you have the interesting time. Because it's choosing those straights. Now, one is shallow and the other, and that's theoretically... Theoretically... What some were suggesting... That... Um, uh, glorious, furious, and courageous were built for the Samso Straits versus the Malmo. Um, theoretically, yes, but honestly, you're probably going to go through the Malmo because that's, whilst it's not the wider one, it is the one further from Germany, and it's the f a deeper one, and you can go through it. But you know, if you can go go through, you you want to try and go through both. Both are interesting. But, it, you know, you don't really need... 
the trouble with building ships specifically for a specific scenario is it gives you a lot of problems. And if they're breaking into the Baltic, then they've also got to deal with the fact that, likely enough, Germany is going to try to roll up Denmark to do it. Now, depending on when that happens in the war, Germany's not going to have many forces available to do it. And the, Den the, De the Denmark... The Danish are at full alert and ready for waiting for them, so they're not going to really get to do that. Will the Danish try and declare neutrality and tell the British they can't go through? They might try that trick to try and prevent themselves from getting embroiled in the war. Will the British take any notice? The odds are no. It's, it'll be fun. Uh, nice ignorant. Would I be right that the Royal Navy is in a non in a non treaty setting where G3 and 3 get built, along with the 234 armed? Again, you're presuming they're going to be called the county class for starters. Um, but you know, you're know, you talking about a, a 9 inch, 9.2 inch gun ship. That's going to be a heavy cruiser. The county class are light cruisers. When the Royal Navy's building them, they're light cruisers. That's what they're considering them still. They're not building them as heavy cruisers. Um, there is a different naming pattern. If you look at what names are chosen for heavy cruisers... Yeah, Devonshire, etc. do come up as heavy cruiser names, armor cruisers, and I reused again, but that's quite a long way down the county class construction list. But it could be. There's there's always an option, they go with them. Um, a six inch gun cruiser would still be built? Yes. Because one's for trade protection and scouting, and one's for uh, fighting and dealing with trade protection in terms of dealing with naval surface raiders rather than merchant surface raiders. Neva Strait's very wide, no. For a transfer done, if in doubt you were being hazed. I don't know. Would it be correct to assume the G3s were to be last battle cruisers built for the Royal Navy? No. You don't know. In a nice way, they weren't built, and Vanguard is uh, Vanguard is described as, in the curious British way a phrase of "we're building a fast battleship, a fully armored battle cruiser." If you remember on Spectrum, it goes battle cruiser two words, battle cruiser one word, fast battleship. Dreadnought, a uh, full bar, uh, something which is focusing on purely on its fire, uh, more its firepower and its armor, and not so worrying about so much about speed. It's basically the slow, never-ending hammer of doom coming towards the direction. So a fully armored, a fully armored takes the battle cruiser across the spectrum to fast battleship, because they they've all got the same guns. They're all supposed to have the same level of guns, the best guns that your nation can produce and put on them. That's the capital ship way. Um, they're both to be smart, or fast, but this one is exchange the battle. Cr basically, as you go along with this, you're exchanging speed for armor. So basically, this is and subdivision. So the more subdivided you're getting, the more armor you're getting. The closer you're getting, the more you're moving from battle cruiser, two words, to battleship dreadnought battleship. And a fully armored battle cruiser, that's a ba fast battleship. So, yeah, do uh, would the G3s be last battle cruisers? I don't know. It depends. They might build the N3s and might then go, right, then actually we want to build four, four, four more battle cruisers. And so, at that point, Hood, Renown, Repulse, and Tiger would become the reserve four battleships, the ones put in ordinary. They might decide they need battle cruisers because they want to be able to do the movement warfare. It, it's it's going to be what they're deciding they need to do at that point. It, basically, a battle cruiser is a system for strategic mobility. Uh, a battle cruise, a battleship is is a unit for strategic strength. And are you if you're trying to square the circle or thread the needle of having both strategic mobility and strategic strength, that's when you're building a fast battleship. If the Italians have launched the Francesco Caracalla. Francesco Caracalla. And the Japanese have launched the Keys. Or are starting to build them. 
then there is a very good chance that the British go with a fast battleship route themselves. What do they do in that scenario? I think you find yourself dealing with something with an F3 kind of layout. Because that's where the British were already heading. And basically they put the engines aft, they cover a lot of armour and they put the guns all forward. Because let's be honest, the F, calling the F3, F2s, battle cruisers is being very genteel with them. They are, because whilst, yes, they're using 15-inch guns, not 16-inch guns. So people can go, that's why sometimes people go, well, when, when you're doing battle cruisers, you, at least, you use less powerful guns. No, you're not. And let's be honest, the differences between a 15-inch 50 and a 16-inch 45 are negligible to non-existence in terms of impact and, cap and real terms effect and capability in terms of a battlefield uh, application. But what you are talking about in that scenario is you're exchanging... You've got a battleship model and you're exchanging some firepower and some armor and some density of subdivision for speed. But realistically, you're working from a battleship down. So you're a fast battleship. You're heading to the fast battleship area. Now, if... Uh, the difference is... Night Secret for one. If you're building 9.2-inch gunships, whilst, yes, heavy cruiser doesn't exist in terms of... or armored cruiser doesn't exist... In terms of the naval treaties and the London Washington naval treaty system, is. I said that many times, so it's fair to point that one out. What you're dealing with, though, is a scenario where they are allowing 9.2 inch guns through. If they're allowing 9.2 inch guns through and larger guns through, that means there was a larger ship being built, which means the British went with the far larger, far more well armored large light cruiser or basically went with the cruiser um in which case it is far closer to what a theoretical heavy cruiser would be because if it's 15 to 18 thousand tons in standard and it's got 9.2 inch guns then I, I you can't really call that a light cruiser Henry Ruffin, if 1940 in South Africa made a declaration of independence, does the UK invade? Um, South Africa was made of the self-governing dominion in 1910, Hendrik Bofa. Um... The UK maintained control of its foreign relations with the world only in not, and not its domestic affairs. So, at that point, it is de facto independent, anyways. So, you're basically saying if they decided to leave the empire in 1914, would the UK invade? No. You don't invade dominions if they go independent. You're also not to an extent surprised. If they went independent and announced their support for the Germans, they'd find themselves in trouble. But honestly, the worst they're probably going to face is a whole massive blockade. And the fact is, they have no navy. Because they haven't invested in one while being in a minion. While being in a minion. So, yeah, that, that's... That... Um, <sighs> Dominions... Uh, it's an interesting scenario, okay? Dominions are a bit weird um, when it comes to talking about a phraseology you should you, you have to use around them. Corbin, I've read before that the Germans studied the triple types of Tekkenhoff class and weren't impressed. 
I'm going to get to the question, end of the question before I answer that one. If the triples weren't so terrible, could we see an early adoption of triples in the high seas fleet? So, okay. I have read other things which have claimed that. I've also read things which have claimed that the, uh, the Germans looked at the triples and looked at the cost of them versus and the cost it would cause them to change and implement in their own production and infrastructure and decided they couldn't afford them. There's also a very interesting analysis put forward that they are they tried to um, buy the designs and the right to produce them off a certain Austrian production company and the company the, uh, the company said well actually why don't we build them for you and that caused even more trouble. I, I think the reality is somewhere in between all of them. Uh, the, uh, the triple turrets from my perspective they are from all the data I've read about them in terms of the Austrian version views on them and the other analysis of them uh, as well as the German analysis of them is that they actually were very good but they didn't really suit what the Germans needed on a strategic level because the Germans were very worried about cost. There's a reason why the Germans don't jump first. If you look at all the technology jumps, they never lead. There's a, they are never part of the qualitative race in terms of battleship design in the, in the naval race. They never, they never jump ahead of the British. They never jump ahead of anyone. Because they're on a very fixed budget, and their budget enemy is the army. And the Averwin, they do. Um, how do I put this politely? I did this when I was talking about the 15 and the Queenless of Class battleships and their, their creation. Basically, them and the R Class finish off the Germany as a naval race. The 15 inch guns on the Queen Elizabeth class mean that the costs are going to increase and basically de facto knock the Germans out because they can't compete, they can't get the funding against the army because they're now starting to invade the army. They're now starting to need to, cut, to fund the navy, they'd have to start for cutting the army and they can't all, and they, they won't do that. And then you have the R class and that just basically wipes it out. So, here is the problem for the Germans of implementing the triple turrets. You're going to increase. Each of those turrets is going to cost more. Let's say you build four turrets. That's going to cost more money. It's also going to require you make a Beamia ship. Um, it's all sorts of infrastructure you're going to need to change. There's all sorts of cranes and other infrastructure you're going to need to change to be able to lift and maneuver them into place. And what do you gain from that? You gain, yes, an advantage. But the thing is, the Germans are trying to compete the British in, for the British with the British in hull numbers, not necessarily in terms of any uh, other criteria. So you get uh, the for the Austrians. There's an advantage in the triple guns. It makes each individual ship more powerful. Why? Because they're not competing with the Italians in terms of hull numbers. They are trying to compete with them on a qualitative level. The Italians are building triple turrets as well. The British certainly have designs of triple turrets. And that's this is finally the other thing for the Germans. Because if they go triple turrets, let's say they do make the announcement, they're going triple turrets. And let's say they do it after the tech offs They study them. And they are beautiful ships. They are being built between 1910 and 1914. If I remember correctly, the Germans go and study them. I think it's 1911-1912. Um, but it might have been slightly uh, uh, slightly earlier. The Queen Elizabeth class are laid down in the end of 1912. If the British had heard any single thing about the Germans going for a triple, even the slightest sniff that the Germans were interested in a triple turret, what do you think the Germans think the British would have done? And the British know all about their visit to Austria to have a look at these things, by the way. Um, it helps that they have connect quite good connections with Skoda, for sure. Too. They have quite good connections with quite a lot of the facilities in Germany. What are the British going to do? The, the Queen Elizabeth class would have been triple turret ships, triple gun ships. Um... They would have had four triple turrets. 
how can I say that? Because as I've shown before in a video, the British, the Vicar, Vickers and several other manufacturers, British turret manufacturers are working on triple turret designs. They have the designs ready to go. The British aren't going with them because they're prefer preferring to bump up the guns. And it's an extra cost they don't need to do and it's an extra issue they don't need to do. But if you want to make the Queen Elizabeth class 28 knots because you have to make them a beamier to take in the guns, uh, take triple turrets, and then you have to make them longer to keep their same length to beam ratio. You can have a lot more space for engines, a lot more space for fuel, that you've basically guaranteed yourself a problem. You've made it far more likely that the Queen Elizabeth class end up being fast battleships. And what do the Germans gain for, looking at tri for going triple turret route? Uh, they lose harder and more quickly. Four triple turret, yeah. Uh, imagine Queen Elizabeth with 12 15 inch guns and 18 and 28 knots. And it's not as if the British couldn't do that. The British could have done that. They had the infrastructure in place. Yes, it would be a bigger jump than they've been planning on doing, but you're talking about they're talking they're building 30,000 plus ton ships anyway, 33,000 tons normal, 33,790 tons deep load. As I said earlier, officially 27,500 tons in standard. Officially. That's what I go with. And Matrix Verdun, I don't think I've ever used that phraseology. Um... But I can't, I'm sure someone has used the phraseology. The German army's the Kaiser's wife, who owns the house and has the dowry. The navy's the mistress he'd like to, leave, uh, to be with, but can't. Yeah. Uh, that does rather fit. There are all sorts of... People like to focus in because one of the scary things to point out the tank offs, and I just want to point... If I was decided talking about the te top 10 battleships, I was talking about this earlier on Twitch, actually. Top 10 battleships of World War One, the Tegadoffs would be quite high up. Honestly, the Queen Elizabeth would probably be top for me. They really would. In in World War One, all around, looking at a value, pound for pound, pick a better battleship than the Queen Elizabeth class. I'll wait. In World War One. But the Tegadoffs... Honestly, those beauties, I'd put them in front of Barden. And Barden's probably the closest you've got to the Queen Elizabeth class. So I would be very tempted to stick those ships possibly in second uh, possibly in second place. But they're again in points, they probably don't get the second place, but I just think they're really well designed ships. They really are. And yeah, that that's the thing that has to be considered about them. Yeah, it's fairly accurate, Verdun. I'll take it. Uh, come on, with it. I did actually just say bigger hulls than historically. I think that was one of the first things I said they would have to be, because to accommodate the triple turret, it would have to be bigger hulls. And the British were going to go 15-inch guns, because they had to, because of the Americans. So the British were going to... The reason the British weren't going 13 and a half inch for the Queen Elizabeth, they were jumping up, was because of the qualitative race of the Americans, because the Americans were going 14-inch. So that's why the British are jumping up one and a half inches to 15-inch. Okay? It also works with the Germans. British notice uh, are judging on these two things. If the Germans are going for triple turret, the Americans, of course, already have a triple turret, and the Brit and all those things going on, the British would go for a triple turret 15-inch gun, and they build a battleship around it. So you would be talking... Honestly, it, could, it might not be that much bigger than it was historically, but we'd, you'd probably be talking about 7,000 tons extra, but uh, 7,000 tons or so. But, uh, yeah... Because, when you think about it, it's... Queen Elizabeth class is already quite beamy, even for their twin guns. Um, they need to have a full-up 
construction, barbettes. You might, uh, you might get away with a beam increasing only to 29 meters from 27.6. And... Let's be honest, the British, when you're looking at the end freeze, you're talking about a beam of 32 metres. The British have the yards to be able to build up that beam quite happily. And the length of the Queen Elizabeth class is 196 metres overall. The end freeze are 249 metres, 9.9 metres overall. I, I think you could be talking about something which is roughly 250 metres, roughly, uh, 250 metres by roughly 30 metres beam. Maybe less. Um, Nelson class is built out of a beam of 32.3 meters. Yeah, there's there's no trouble infrastructure-wise of British in building a, a much bigger ship than than Queen Elizabeth's. I think I've been over that as well before. I agree, Carmel Gasbuck. For um, triples with one barrel turret range of cells, they do hurt. Yeah. Um, yeah, 15-inch guns are going to happen. Well, yeah, Fisher, uh, and don't take this the wrong way, but there is a, all sorts of play made of Fisher suggesting it's a Churchill and all sorts of things, and then you go back and you find that Jellicoe's been working on notes and there's been a project running on the 15-inch guns for about a year and a half by that point. Um, potentially two years, depending on how you decide it. Uh, you always have to remember there is great men history, um, and there are there are examples actually. And this is one of the interesting things I come up with: is there are truly are moments in time which you can literally point to one person being stubborn and making a decision and pushing something through. You can literally do that, but that's very rarely the case. In the case of the fifteen-inch guns, etc. That had already been going for quite a while by the time Churchill gets involved and actually for even longer before Fisher actually realises what's going on. Because believe it or not, uh, amongst the contemporaries, quite a lot of them believe the fastest way to publicise something in the press was to tell Fisher about it. Yeah, Jellico is in many ways the Henderson on Rivera. He is pushing through quite a few interesting things. Hold on. If you replace Macar for 24 hours notice of Philippines invasion, what's your choice of action? Assume full authority of, Co of Cobb Pipe Man. Um. If I've given um, 24 hours notice of the Philippines invasion and I assumed command, I've repla complete replacement with Carfa, I am dispersing my troops. I am maneuvering, my, I'm dispersing my troops to all their wartime defense positions. I'm enacting the various plans. I'm dispersing my aircraft. I'm getting my fighters up in the air, putting all my forces on maximum alert, and I'm getting everything I can out of any um, un reinforced on a sort of non-secure position so that they're all secured position and I'm dispersing civilians if I can to places where they are out of the way of fighting uh, no, sorry, question 32 how fair is it to blame naval treaties of Mark Rawls demise in the 41 and 
Yeah, uh, um, it's a compromise because of the treaty system. So yeah, it's, it's down on the treaties, but it's the compromise made. So it's what they chose to compromise on. And follow up to question 32, question 33, four. Uh, would the 5,000 extra tons of auxiliary generators really say that? Yes. Yes. That's, that, that's a no-brainer, yes. In other words, let's put an HMS Implacable in the spot of Ark Royal and have it have the same issues. Watch what happens. That that's the basically the scenario you're talking about. Um They had a layered system of liquid and air-filled compartments, which was similar to that used in Lustrous class, and was designed to resist a 750-pound explosive charge. Um, the magazines for the 4.5-inch guns lay outside the armament of the Citadel, but were protected by 2-3-inch two, uh, two thick roofs, 4.5-inch thick sides, and 1.5-2-inch thick ends. Um, yeah. That's the difference. So, basically you're going, does an implacable suffer, an implacable class suffer the same problem as Ark Royal if it's hit the same way? No. By Maximus, also on the scenario where the British break in the Baltic. Could they start convoy supply routes to the Russians and also do shore bombing to help them? Yes, yes. If they've managed to smash the German fleet that much, yeah, they can. But honestly, they're going to be blockading Germany, and without the supplies coming through Scandinavia, Germany's going to be mm, schnuckered. That we're literally talking weeks. And now it's a question of anyone. So, is it right to say that if the G3 gets built, the Royal Navy cannot build cruisers is total... Yes. Why wouldn't they be able to build cruisers? Uh, who's been putting this one round? You can either build the G3s or build cruisers. The British were building G3s and cruisers at the same time. They're called the Hawkins class. They're annoying, but they're being built at the same time as they're building the G3s. And they've got plans to follow them on with more cruisers. And I've got ideas about 9.2 inch gun cruisers and all sorts of things. So, yeah, that th that's just uh, that's just is someone having a flight of fancy. Um, I'm not sure where my economics book is up there somewhere now. I think it's over there. Uh, but yeah, that just no. Go look at the actual economics of the UK. Look at how much they're spending on defence in that time period. And I said six one. So if a K three and L three are so terrifying, what could the USN IG and realistically respond with, as they'd have to? Whatever they come up with. Honestly, you're probably looking at a super South Dakota, a, a super South Dakota, from the Americans and the IGN. Whatever they can dream up with, uh, that's what they're gonna think about.
Hey, did any gem warships, surface or subs, have the range to reach the colonies in Africa in 1940? Um, well, they had some ships out there. So basically, if they're out in the world, they could theoretically reach there. So let's say you, you, your case might be, okay, could um, Spey, von Spey, could he get to, uh, to Africa? Yeah, he could theoretically of. But the trouble is he'd have then been running straight into Austra HMAS Australia and her, co her ships. Um, so he probably wouldn't have made it. In terms of submarines, some of their subs might, especially the big ones they build for trading across the Atlantic, could possibly have done it with modifications, but they're not really going to be much help once they get there. How would it affect the German fleet situation in World War One if they went for oil powered ships getting oil from Austria, Austria and Galatia? Okay, if they go for oil powered ships, that oil firing ships are going to be better. And they did some of their boilers, I think, were oil sprayed on coal. Um, were oil were a combination, I think. Was it Baden's boilers? Let's check the button class machinery. Yeah, uh, they were Biden, Bayern and Biden were both uh, were both equipped with coal-fired Schultz Fornicroft boilers and oil-fired Schultz Fornicroft boilers. Um, they had three oil-fired ones and eleven coal-fired ones, and. So they are, they often do have mixture. So if you're basically going for oil, the, the big problem for the Germans is that the amount of oil they can get in terms of supply is not that great. So the oil production of those fields is not massive. And it's needed for other things. But because the oil that's coming from those fields is not really what you tend to use for ship fuel. Ship fuel is terrible oil. It's the worst you can possibly imagine. You, you can get better quality out there, but then that's fuel you can't use for your airplanes and your tank and your lorries and other vehicles. And that that's the problem. So you can do that. And it does probably give them a slightly faster, slightly more efficient fleet in terms of operations. But it also means it's going to be a lot more difficult to sustain. And it's going to be more expensive as well. Oh, basically the British in the run up to World War Two have a big carrier program, a battleship program, and cruiser program, and they have destroyer program, and they have a submarine build. They're basically building everything. Let's turn if you're not sure if there's any point in asking. Mm-hmm. Let's go to the question though. Out of the pre N3 and G freeze, what are the odds that any that one of them will be built after the N3 G freeze? Also as to be honest, the fifty two thousand ton K three and fifty one thousand K seems like what's next after G three N three. I would expect them to be in a much improved versions. So the thing is their designs might be superficially similar, but it's probably gonna be like the L's 70 and the daring class they have a lot of similarities but they have a lot of experience and ideas put in there so whilst they might well go with designs which are not too dissimilar because you've got those design studies already as a basis to work from they will be iterations upon the idea Paul Westwick triple gun turret on the Kinesis class does hope to follow the same pattern well let's put it this way 
if the Queen Elizabeth are triple guns, then the Renata Revengers will be triple guns. If the Revengers are triple guns, then Renown and Repulse will be triple guns. Also, let's be honest, so would Courageous and Glorious. Uh, Courageous and Glorious will be triple gun ships because they they'd have to. So they'd uh, they magically have six guns, two triple turrets, a triple one fore and aft, which might actually make them more viable. Good God! You're gonna make Renown and Repulse though nine gun ships, and all the R class for all the R class battleships are twelve gun ships. So of course Hood will be twelve gun ships as well as a twelve gun ship as well. So what you've basically done is you've added fifty percent more guns onto every single one of the fifteen inch ships. That could have an impact on things. Does it suddenly make Courageous and Glorious more viable? Not sure about that, but... The thing is... If Furious is designed again on expanded platform... She could end up being a twin turret ship. Twin gun turret ship. So she could end up with four 18 inch guns. And suddenly, a large chunk of the problems with her goes to an extent away because you're not two single guns. Okay, yes, four, tw four guns in two twins is not great for salvoing, and frankly, it's blooming annoying. But it's a world away from two singles. Shana, Renown are repulsed with... Uh, Renown, Renown with nine guns, yeah. But let's be honest. What you're dealing with is a world where most of those ships are going to be about 50% heavier. Not, not, not sort of 50% heavier, but are going to be at least a third heavier. Um, in sort of, sort of some things, etc. Because they're going to have to be slightly fatter in beam and slightly longer so to retain the length to beam ratio. Might actually make them slightly faster in some regards because uh, you can fit more engines in them and you can modernize them more. So you're going to change all sorts of things. So basically, if you want to change the world dramatically, you make the Queen Elizabeth guns, uh, Queen Le the 15 inch gun turrets forward, triple gun, triple turrets in the Royal Navy. And that's going to dramatically change history. You want to add in some more fun? You make, you get all the guns to the level at which they can fire angle wise in 1939 when they've been fully upgraded. So they can all get up to, you know, 35, 40 degrees. Triple turrets, that sort of, and that sort of an advantage. Then they, uh, the the range advantage in Battle of Jutland, etc., and all those things is just going to be terrible for him to fight. Uh, Dragon Red, IGN factionalism. Was it a side effect or part of the cause of Japan's tendency to distantly support each other in operations, or was this a support caused by limits in communication? Feel free to pass. All of the above. All of the above. That's the, that's the reality. It's all of the above. What would the um, so basically they get they have problems coming in all directions and then Gobion, uh, Gobion. Uh, what would the oh Mars Revenge you're here. Hello. Um, what would the American response to the forty? Uh, a 4 by 3 28 knot Queen Elizabeth look like, and would they even please Congress for the mo that money before World War One? Mm, honestly, the American response to the Queen Elizabeth class, if we consider historically,
So the Quinglers of Class are laid down in 1912 and launched in 1913. That's when you really know what's coming in terms of that. So for that you need to look at then what the Americans are laying down really in 1913 onwards. So you're looking at the Pennsylvania class and then the New Mexico's. The Pennsylvanias, they have 12 14 inch guns in four triple turrets. The New Mexico's, they have 12 14 inch guns in triple turrets. Um, what does the Tennessee class have? 12 14 inch guns in triple turrets. So what do I think the Americans do in that scenario? Well, if the Queen of Class have used the space and uh, the space given to them by being triple turret designs to increase their size, uh, increase their use, uh, you know, to give them more power as well, more boiler space, and get themselves to 28 knots, then I think maybe the Americans revise some of their ideas on the standard class battleships in terms of their speed. In terms of gunnery, I think they're just going to push forward with a 60 inch gun like they did historically. That's it, and that's they're going to want to go into a six into a four triple sixteen inch gun scenario, rather than wait around with the um eight uh, with the the sort of ten gun scenario I think they had, um at one point. So that's it basically. War spider armed with twelve fifteen inch guns. Um yeah. Mole's Revenge, what do you estimate to be the mass of your Naval History Library to nearest ton? Um, I think, I, I forget what a maximum weight these are allowed to be. But I know I've already filled out here. Plus that one, that's 21. So that's 21 boxes out here. That's another 10, uh, 10 boxes there, 10 boxes there. So there's roughly 40 boxes of books already, and I haven't finished packing them. Probably will end up being about 60 boxes of books. I uh, work out from that 60 boxes of these books. Um, they vary in, depending on the book size, you know, some of them are stuffed full of these. So they can, they can pick like, um, so that's eight by two. By two plus some more, so eight by four thirty-two. Yeah, that does. Yeah, and that's the books which are going down by this methodology. There are books which have gone down already in big crates because they have my protected books, and there are books which have gone down, uh, which I've just dropped off with. Have gone down in plastic boxes already. So yeah, uh, I have no idea. <laughs> Uh, oof. These bo the books don't weigh the same. Some of them are bit like this and quite light. And 23 kilogram. 1.3 tons, roughly. And there's, yeah, there's a few more books as well. So you, you are, you're, you're probably somewhere in the region of that Mole's Revenge of about, eh, probably somewhere in the region of one and a half to two. When it's all transported and moved. I'm hoping that property we're buying we're going and we're buying has enough concrete in its foundations. Well, to my mind, it makes other nations likely to ask for more ships and more guns rather than the UK, Arsenal, Nelson, Ronnie. 
Oh, the UK didn't ask for Nelson and Rodney. They made Nelson and Rodney with those 16-inch guns a, criteria, a requirement for them joining the actual treaty. If they didn't get the new 16-inch gun ships, they weren't signing up to the treaty. That was literally the, the, the line the British government took. And so that's going to be... Yeah, in a nice way, other nations might well go, hang on, look at how powerful your ships are. But historically, those ships were that powerful anyway. Were 15-inch gun ships anyway. The difference was it was 12, 14-inch guns versus 8, 15-inch guns. So, you know, and a little bit of a speed advantage. If they're all, if they're 28 knot ships with 12, 15-inch guns, uh, then, yeah, they're going to have fun. What impact does the Royal Navy have in more HMS Unicorn types so have on their own post-World War II? They do sort of have it, because they have two light fleet carriers, which are sort of being converted to the role as well. Um, so basically, having them is a useful addition, but they're not massively advantageous in a peacetime scenario. They're really something useful in a wartime scenario where you don't... A wartime scenario or a peacetime scenario where you don't have a lot of infrastructure. In well, post World War Two world, you build up a lot of infrastructure, and but they're still useful. She does a lot of work in in Korea, but you just don't need really more than one of her. Good luck with the gun prep, uh, VMW moves. Thank you. Moving the library is fun and expensive. Seriously. If there's any lawyers and banking watching, a bankers, what lawyers and bankers watching? Can you please answer me a small question? Do you spend your entire time coming up with inventive ways to try and bill me? And I, I, I do not mean this jokingly. I mean this seriously. Do you spend your entire time coming up with ways to try and bill me? Because it, it, it's quite cruel. The sheer amount of bills which keep appearing. No, my sister is not doing garden work at the moment. She's upstairs boxing up her library. Oh, that's another fun thing. My sister's library is the smallest of the family's libraries, and she is still boxing up quite a huge amount. It's fun. Uh, don't get me started on my mother's library. That's that's that that's very big, and that's um. Yeah, that's just enjoyable. Chatception. Take care, Cam Gazwood. It's Monday already for you. Okay. Cheesy airplane pilot romanticature. Yeah, she's got a fair chunk of that, but honestly, my sister is also a doctor of civil engineering, as I said before, a Jew. A geotechnical civil engineer, and she has textbooks and all sorts of books which are for her engineering. So, um, yeah, anyone who likes to tell you that engineering is all about, you know, the digital world these days and is all digital are talking, yeah. And then you've got my mum's books, which is probably, I'd say level pegging with me. I would say honestly level pegging with me. Um, 
Yeah. That's just that's just a lot of books. Um, no, my mom's my mom's collection of books do not believe. <laughs> my mom's collection of books. But yeah, um, my mom has pretty much every um. Let's put it this way: she nicks a lot of my books, but I also nick some of her books for my some of my teaching, because she picks up a lot of autobiographies of people like major politicians, those sort of people. Um, she pit reads a huge amount of gardening manuals and a lot of science textbooks. She really likes her chemistry and biology and um, do not get her started on plant life and plant science. Um, and of course she has her gunnery tables and her various books on the history of various forms of unarmed combat. <sighs> So yeah, um, my mum has less cheesy romances than my sister does, and my sister has a fair number, but to be honest, I've long ago my sister realised that hers form a similar function as the various non-fiction books that in mine, they're her way of going, you know what? I've had enough of this for one day. I need to take my brain off my topic. So, yeah, I'm going to have something which is the complete opposite of my topic. And I have also got some cheesy romances because, don't take this the wrong way, some days I do work which is on various uh, genocides, etc. And honestly, the trick I was taught when I was younger than I am now, a lot longer than I am now, uh, when I first started working on the area, by a very experienced academic who'd worked on the area for his li their, all his life, was that um, if you spent your day reading the absolute worst of humanity, read something which is the complete opposite, which is so saccharine sweet it's almost absurd, um, to try and rebalance, because it's the only option you have. You want to read something which isn't going to make you cry or anything like that, because honestly, you need to find good emotions, not bad emotions, to get to manage it. And yeah, that's been my policy for years. I've had that policy. If I spend a day doing things like genocide work, and I have written whole reports on genocides, Um, and all sorts of things. You have to, as part of your program of study at King's, you have to do work in that area as well if you want to, what you used to do in my period. And uh, so you study it all, you teach it all, and if you don't want that stuff living in your head when you get home, and you don't want to have to relive it all night, you have something which is completely different to read on the train home. And for me, I found a fair number of authors who write books which were, how do I put this, um, quite a few were about ice hockey teams, baking, that sort of things, um, had that sort of scenario, in, and I quite like those sort of books. Um, a fair number of cowboy books, those sort of things. But, you know, it's the case of it's the complete opposite to what I've spent my day doing. And I'm quite open about this. I teach this to students. And a fair number have come back to me going, yeah, I thought you were talking twaddle. And then I went through it and um, I tried it going the uh, all macho 
not doing that sort of thing way and I didn't sleep for about a week and then I tried it your way and I actually could get to sleep at night and went yeah well the thing is with me is it doesn't matter whether I've read them or not I'm still not sleeping but I prefer not to lie awake with that in my mind either so if I will take anything I can to get it off Read the Bible. Oh, good lord, not doing that. Don't take this wrong way. I, ha I have read the Bible, and I have read it quite regularly. I've read quite a few of the other books, actually. But, uh, no, reading the Bible doesn't help. Um, as lovely as it is in parts, it's also it's a very ecumenious book with a lot of teachings in, like most holy texts are. And um, that's a fun one. Charts and surveys. The History of the RN Hydrographic Service, 1919 to 1970. Um, but the trouble is, it's got a lot of fighting, especially in the Old Testament. And fairly sort of good stuff in the New Testament as well, frankly. Um, so no, the bite, and that's not a good scenario for me, and that's sorry. There are some who do find out the solace they need, but it's not doesn't work for me. <laughs> yeah, lawyers have a field day in all sorts of things. Uh, it's a it's a fun system at the moment. I think it always has been. That's other things like that I read as well. Cookbooks. I basically read all sorts of stuff to try and organize my organize my brain. That's a good one, by the way. That's a good book. If you're dealing with people in your life who are dieting and you want to give them nice food that doesn't taste like diet food, Harry Biker's Diet Diet Dieters is a good book. Um, Dave Myers, of course, has recently died, but yeah, I think it was Dave who died. Yeah, I think it was Dave. But yeah, it's a good one. Take care, Paul Bearswick. Um, I sorry, question 28. Are there any officers in the Royal Navy who were wrongfully punished for something that they did? Yes, tons. But there are also some who escape punishment for things which they did. So, you know, life wears out. It's a human organisation. If you want me to remember them all off the list of my, on top of my head, that would be a very long list. And it would be a judgement call for every single one because, you know, they made decisions with the best information they had at the time. I can make decisions based on the information I have now. It's often a different decision. Oof. Fat. Goes there. Um, let's battle over the plate. That is Nelson of Wellington. Does that fit in? That's not going to be too fat, is it? That's too fat. And I don't want my King's College London thing in there. I will have to find that space again. It's going to be annoying. But I think I can do it. Yay, that goes there. So, that goes there, that could go there, that will go there. Da -da -da -da. Uh, 
Um, there are all sorts of issues when it comes to taxing on this thing. Because you see, it's... <sighs> Technically, also, there is all sorts of issues because of... And I, I don't want to get into it, because it's a full tax, uh, tax fund, but it's trying to work it out so it's accurately taxed, not as it could be in... Uh, there's a theoretical tax and there's an accurate tax, but... <sighs> it's fun. It's all sorts of complicated, joyous things which make lots of people rich, not me. Oh, you both have some model too. You have heavy cruisers. Hmm. I very realized very quickly you don't move home to get rich. Anyone who says that is talking twaddle. You don't. It's gonna. The pro, the whole process is is going to make you poor. <laughs> oh, good lord! It definitely is. It definitely is for work. It, that, that doing that for me. <laughs> um, question twenty-seven. If HMS Majesty crew had known just how severe the damage from the MTV torpedo attack was, would there be any controversy about scuttling her? Probably not, but you never know. Um, the thing is, she's a town class cruiser. So, Doe's built up a reputation of being very hardy ships. And a lot of people believe they could survive pretty much anything. And let's be honest, some of them did. If they were lucky about where they were hit, they could survive a huge amount of damage. And you can't really argue with that as a statement. So, that's where the problem for the crew comes from. It's not so much what she actually had, but the impression of the whole class. They are good, strong ships. They do survive and do take a lot of damage at various points in the war. So that's the reality of what the crew's up against. They're up against the image of the class, not the reality of the situation. ever been so, honestly. In those sort of situations, you're up against as much the image of the class as a whole as you are up against what you actually, what actually happened. <laughs> uh, but sure I, I imagine I mean Dr. Clark's mom's collection, although I don't want to know what this is there. <laughs> Probably a collection of state secrets is not meant to be known about. <laughs> oh good lord. I don't want to go there either, honestly. My mom's got uh, my mom has done uh, uh, and seems to know far too many people sometimes. Oh that's sad. I think that is a problem. I get that out. It is fairly narrow across there, but it's not quite right there. Be 
interesting. Yeah, we have that. Okay, right. I need this. Right. Good night, Richards. Let's see, what's the next question? Um, Brian Polos, how will the British doctrine and strategy change if the Washington Treaty had a moderate number of nine to two, nine inch twelve thousand ton cruisers and a limited number amount of six to eight for uh, six inch eight thousand ton cruisers? So if the Washington Treaty basically had a variation of the, se of the Second London Treaty, um, the British would have maxed out their number of nine inch uh, nine inch twelve thousand ton cruisers. Um, the they'd have then max they'd have then been building as many of the six to eight inch cru cruisers as they could as well. Basically, the, the British are prepared to build the limit of whatever they build. And that's what the Royal Navy want to do. And people often say, oh, it's costs. It, no, it's it's going to sound strange. It's not that the government don't have the money. So the government would prefer to spend the money on other things. So that's what happens with the cruisers. It's not they don't have the money to spend on the cruisers. They do. But they prefer to spend it on other things. And that's just ended. That's a small problem. I have run out of tape. I'm not getting any more tape from that. And that's not really worth it. So that box is going to have to remain open till tomorrow. As I said, I thought I'd run out of tape before I ran out of books or boxes. And remind me please before I go, before I end this evening, and I'm not going to end for a little while, because I'm going to try and answer some more questions, I need to take those laptops back. Oh, good lord. That I haven't got a firm hold on at all. Oh, I haven't. Oh, oh, yeah, oh, done, oh, good long room, but I can do that, 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 and I don't want to smash into you guys, so, that up there, oh, These also go here. There we go. Done. Hey, by gum. That was, that was fun. Oh. Oh. Right. Hello, camera. I'm down here. Looking sweaty and horrid. Yeah, that's me. That's me. What da 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 Oh. Oh. Right now. This camera, I'm going to put it back to the position I stored it in. Purely from the perspective of. I need to uh, use it for other things tomorrow. Oh, again, I'm, I'm back out here. Hello, I know, you, you, you lose me. Hello, yes. You did well. Um, yeah, if the British have 9.2 inch gun cruisers after the battle, after the Washington, uh, Washington Naval Treaty, then yeah, the Panther Chief doesn't look like a good idea on any circumstances. It's always a nice to have a dream, but it's not really effective. Um. Uh, so for incomparable to be built, does 66,000 tons seem sound and seem more likely? Um, 
that's putting out a third again on the size of hood. I suppose it's a start. It, you're, you're, it's more likely, but I don't think it would be. I think it's probably more likely incomparable as proposed by Jackie Fisher versus as as the Ron David actually built something on the scale of incomparable. As proposed by Jackie Fisher, you're looking at a scaled up renown. In which case, honestly, because that's his that's it, that's his way, his joyousness, and that's what you're you're scaling up. So you're scaling up from renown. Renown, remember, is lighter than ti lighter than tiger. Tiger's a battle cruiser. Um, renown and repulsor build as battle cruisers. The gap between the words. So, in comparable, we built probably about the same. So, you're looking at more a scaled up renown and repulse. So, let's go for more like 50,000 tons in standard. Thomas, uh, Thomas Kozak. It strikes me that perhaps the library should be measured in tons of burthen. Certainly mine is starting to think that. Uh, if the RN gets 9.2 inch guns, cruisers in watching Naval Trade, then the, yeah, answer that one. Um, I see, which one's mentioned that? Why was the order to scuttle impossible to rescind five minutes after being given? Because it had been given and because of the state of communications inside the ship. It's awesome. What do you think of the logical maximum size for each class of ship? Honestly, I don't see aircraft carriers getting much bigger than the forward class. I don't see the point, really. If you, if you want to, why are you getting bigger than that? And yes, aircraft carriers are dependent on the size of their aircraft. But once you're dealing with hulls and hangars that big, and... You know, what are the aircraft sizes going to grow? Are fighters... Uh, looking at the jump between an F-35B and a Harrier, you can see the difference in scale for the Queen Elizabeth class. They should actually probably be slightly bigger. Um, you can see differences in all sorts of things. You can see the reasons for things. If you look at the scale of carrier of aircraft carried in 1930 versus the scale of aircraft carried, it explains the size of carrier. With battleships... I think you're looking slightly greater than Yamato, but not much. Honestly, I I would say myself the greatest practical size battleship you'd see was something supporting 12, 18 inch guns, and that'd be someone who really did want 18 inch guns. Um, I honestly do think 16 and a half inch guns would be the would be the actual preferred limit once you're looking at the range, rate of fire, and um, the size, but then you might be talking about something which has quadruple 16 and a half inch guns. So it could have four quadruple turrets. I built one of those for UAD. It's in the current campaign going along. It tends to wipe out most uh, most enemies it comes on. Even ones which have 17, 18 inch guns tend to find themselves going, so we're against something which is basically a machine gun battleship. Yeah. And occasionally, if I'm feeling really cruel, I build something which has five or six triple turrets. And that is really, really cruel because triple turrets have a slightly higher rate of fire than quadruple turrets. And you still have that same magical formula of of over 12 guns. So it makes salvoing in and ranging that much easier. Are there any class of ships that the Iron should never build? I can understand the logic and reasoning for the Lord Nelsons, but I honestly wish they hadn't, because I think it would be better if they built if they built more than HMS Dreadnought as that first Dreadnought battleship. I think you needed to build at least two ships, preferably three or four in that first batch. You shouldn't have put all the eggs in one basket. But there again, Britain honestly didn't need to not build Lord Nelsons to do that with the Dreadnoughts. They should have built, they should have ordered four as a get go. They should have just done it. And the fact they didn't is something which always disappoints me. Because also, if they'd done that, you changed the world immediately. You changed the equation. The British have built four of these ships. 
and they're already working on the next batch, and they then build four Invincibles. You know, that sort of works to me. They build four, four Dreadnoughts and then four Invincibles, and then they build four more. And suddenly they're at 12, and everyone, and even if the Germans are starting on, well, we're going to build four this, you're already a long way behind. Uh, I think that's the more the scenario. I, and I'd say things like HMS Captain, etc. I wish they hadn't built because it's a waste of money, but and a waste of good crew, but that's life sometimes. You get these things happen. You, do, you don't have the computer testing to disprove model. You don't have the computer models you can show to people. You don't have all that scenario you can do to get things like HMS Captain not built, so you have to deal with the fact that they're going to be built. Why wouldn't 12 18-inch guns be the standard after the N3G freeze? Um, because, honestly, someone would try and build something bigger. Someone would. And the trouble is, whilst they could might have been able to make it practical, I don't think they are. Someone would have tried a 20-inch gun or a 22-inch. You know, let's be honest, the Americans, it's British are building 18-inch guns. What does the Americans done every time? They've gone for one bigger. The British go 15-inch, the Americans go 16. If the British are going 18-inch... Well, the Americans theoretically should jump to 18 inch, but you know, someone, uh, someone over there is going to insist they have a Navy second to none, so they're going to build a 20 inch gun ship, which means the British will respond. Will they respond with a 20 a 19 and a half inch gun ship? No. Will they respond with a 21 inch gun ship? Yes. So the British will do that. The British will jump three inches. The Americans will jump four inches. The British will jump three inches from the 18 inch to the 21 inch. And then they'll realize just how slow and ineffective they are. And they'll come. The, you probably use the fast battleship concept. Oh, we're building a fast ship, so you know we've had to drop the guns down to get them down to either 18 inch or 16 and a half inch. Because they look at their rate of fire and the rate of salvoing and the ranging, and they go, "Hang on, we can get a lot better from these guns." So basically, you've got till I finish this glass of iron brew. I'm going to do till the brew runs out. It's kind of sad that pads and steam had been restored to one of the turbines, rudder unjammed. And power restored to steering motors 45 minutes before scuttle ordered. Info reached captain five minutes after order. Yeah. Trouble is, those are mostly on delay timers, which can't be, once they're started, can't be stopped. There's a reason scuttling charges, etc., can't be stopped. To stop the enemy taking the ship. Ay, caramba. Oof. So how's everyone doing? How's your day been? I've been packing boxes all day. <laughs> and Twitch streaming and sorting things out and oh good lord. Also, I have to say, I'm getting more and more worried about my mother and um, VTubing. I, I honestly am starting to think she might be heading for that direction herself, but we'll leave that to one side. Some of the questions she had today, which was included, was, So what's the... the how does it, this VTubing software connect with OBS? You have OBS? Well, I've been playing around with it. I didn't know VTube... Okay, I'm going to have to look this up. All right, mother. Yes. Um, that was the discussion this morning when I was trying to eat my bre trying to get breakfast, which is probably why I didn't have breakfast. <laughs> uh. Nine six hundred. So fifteen, sixteen and a half inches more likely firing on nineteen thirty uh, ships. Well, basically, if you've had, uh, my view is. 
The Royal Navy will have the 16.5 inch guns on the G-Freeze. And they'll have the 18 inch guns on the N-Freeze. And then the Americans, I said, will, might respond with something bigger. The British will respond with something bigger. And they'll, they'll be looking and evaluating, let's say, 21 inch, 18 inch and 16.5 inch guns. And they'll be looking at them going, well, hang on. What's the results? What's the fire plan results of these guns? 16 and a half inch works out better. It's the poundage, it's all these things. And so then they're going to go, well, we're doing a fully armoured battlecruiser. Perhaps they even call it a fully armoured battlecruiser rather than a battleship to explain why they're using the 16 and a half inch guns, because that's what they use on the G3s. Godmin ship gold. I, I do not, do not, don't go there. I have no idea, but yeah. I have no idea what my what's happening. I do not want to know. I'm not getting into this conversation. That sounds fun, Malraj. Um... Runon? I'm not sure where the comment comes from. Ah, that makes sense. Not bad. Went to a family's birthday. Spent some time talking to Alco. Found out he's engaged. Quite quick from going. Burn him. No. Oh, yeah. Well, in my experience, that happens a lot. People go away on long trips. They come home and, you know, reuniting. Let's get engaged. But, you know, sometimes these things work out. Don't. <laughs> um. Scuttling charges. Yeah, but not all scuttling charges are the same. And also, it depends how quickly your crew set them for. There are all sorts of funds they had with that with my HMS Manchester. There's all sorts of mixed communications going on there. But I did an entire video about Manchester. I, I think I did an entire video discussing Manchester and getting into it. So, I, without my notes in front of me, I'd rather not go into too much detail for fear of... Because I know, and I don't want to say something which upsets some of the families, without you know being accurate. And do I have dyslexia and names? I don't want to get into specifics, so I'll leave it to that video where I discussed it before. I I I don't don't know don't go to Sonic Nero. Um, You have your 15-minute call. <laughs> Good luck, Tomas. <laughs> so, anyway, at our six-year high school reunion, one girl managed to be married with three kids. Eh. Um, place in fuse wells of bombs or shells for use. Yeah... <laughs> Look, in the nicest way, I have said before, if I had a VTuber avatar, and this was discussed, uh, what uh, asked me, why was it, uh, I was asked this at some point, was it by my mum? No, I don't know, but if I was going to base it off any ship, um, it would be either HMS Renown or HMS Unicorn. Tempted by Implacable, but probably that. I was considering going for a tribal class destroyer, but honestly, 
I, I don't think the level of sveltness of my figure would really fit something destroyer-shaped. So I've gone for something which is slightly girthier. Um, and that's why I've gone with Renown. Though she's not, she's not a fat girl, but she's, she is slightly, uh, more beamier than a tribal class destroyer. So that, that would be, and it would be not a girl avatar. <sighs> nice way. There are enough. I, I, it's enough being the only boy in my family out of 40 cousins. I, I, no, no. The, the amount of ribbing and the amount of... I would get no, just not doing that one. I also love this, because I have such a deep singing voice, they ne and they never in... And at school, whenever I was sort of in plays and everything, never in anyone considered giving me the girl parts. And because I started having a beard at about 12. It's nearly midnight for me, and I've got half a glass to go. So let's know when your mum starts it. Look, if she starts it, I will let you know, but... Oh, good lord. <laughs> There's not enough iron brew to deal with that scenario. Oh, it's when my mother, when it turns out she has a channel which has more subscribers than me and Drac. That's the problem. That's what that's what happened. Both me and Drac be sitting there going. Okay, well mine's a low bar for her to pass, but yours as well. How did that happen? No idea. I did point out, you know, I pointed out VTuber, you know, they did, they do, do play games, and she said, that's fine. I've got quite good scores on Helldiver. She has as well. So, you know. I'm not going to give away her name on Helldiver, but I will say this. Um, if if you come across a uh, older lady helldiver who is basically farming bots for XP because she seems to be developing specific ways of how to kill them, um, yeah, that's that could well be my mother. And this is also the reason why I am not playing helldiver. My mum is still the, the reigning family champion on Goldeneye. And the reigning champion on Sonic in our family. I just about have a higher score than her on Halo, but it's not far enough for me to gloat about it. <laughs> what about Perfect Dark? I'm not sure. Um, I don't know which uh, if she's played that one. <laughs> no, no, I really want to hear your I'm going to be started on a... Oh, good lord. She doesn't have World of Warships, does she? I don't think so. I think she doesn't have that. She likes, um... She really likes first-person shooters. She she does like... She likes the first-person character games. So she was far more into Tomb Raider than me or my sister ever were. I, I'm currently the family... I, I, I beat her on Total War, just...
Drew Banishing. I'm not sure what Hell... Unless, wait, this is why I'm not... I'm not playing Helldivers, so I don't really have... I'm not playing it because, in the nicest way, I know I'll end up in a team with my mum. And then if anything happens to her or it doesn't go to plan, I will get blamed for it. And I can't get away from that because she's my mum, so I can't block her phone number or anything. So, no. <laughs> no, she lost her. In, she and a couple, a few missions recently. She's lost her entire squad, and all the other ones. You because know, you dropped in, get dropped in four, and she's all the other three have got taken out, and she's just gone taken. Out. She was one of them. She took, she's quite proud the other way. She took out one of the giant bots. She took out solo. I'm still not quite sure how she did it, but apparently involved shooting it in all the weak spots. And I was sort of going, how do you know the weak spots? Well, I'd sort of figured them out, but then I found a guide online where people talked about it and realised that I was quite right, but I'd missed one of them. So you figured out all the other weak spots apart from one of them? Yes. And then what do you do? Well, basically I hit them in all the weak spots at the same time, as quickly as possible. <laughs> Sorry. Hang on, I'm in a server where I can possibly run into her. Mm. So yes, uh, she is. She's she's fairly proficient. So I was just la I was laughing while I still had iron brew in my mouth, I think, or something. Um, when I <laughs> said I'm a server where I can run into her. <laughs> <laughs> Melanie, you can have that conversation with her. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> the big dots on Hell Day 2 is a Hulk. Okay, that's good. I think possibly in one ga a couple of games, she might have, instead of chasing straight off the objectives, spent her time trying to engage the bots and figuring things out. Um... She does tend to achieve her. She's doing. I, I, I understand that she's doing quite well for someone who plays a maximum of uh, two or three hours at a time, and mostly on my old Dell laptop, my old Dell Latitude laptop, which is, you know, fun. At least I think that's what she's playing on. Yeah. Yeah, that is what she's playing on. Because I don't think she... She doesn't have a PlayStation at the moment. We don't have any. And we don't... The only console game... A console system we have is the Sega. Mega Drive. Oh, it's got a graphics card. Um, this is going to sound strange. I had... Uh, I tended uh, for a while when I was going through various work things because I worked with Dell in terms of I was uh, a, a um, IT technician for the university and one of the partners we worked with was Dell and I managed to get quite a friendship with them because we were ordering we were already ordered a lots of machines and I wasn't in charge of the ordering process at all but I was one of the people who did a lot of the fixing and when it was a problem I'd be on the phone to Dell. So I made friends with them, and I did some of my qualification stuff. And um, so when I was getting to the end of my bachelor's, you know, they get you know, and I said, oh, I'm going to be graduating going soon. And they said, oh, well, make sure you call up this person if you want to get a new laptop. Well, I did want to get a new laptop, and so I did. And then when I finished my PhD, I treated myself to another new laptop. And that was that Dell. Uh, another Dell, and then a few years later, I treated myself to another Dell laptop, and because I'd been working well and got some work, and I, I, I contacted my old friend and said, "So, you know, what's your recommendations?" Oh, call cool this. So, um, I've always got basically the top of lane, uh, the top of the range Dell Latitude laptops without paying top of the range prices, uh, because just because I because I had friends who I knew how to call, so they would tell me where to go to get the vouchers, and where to go to get the things. and you could, They're all things open to everyone else. But they just tended to 
tell me what I would have I'd spent hours trying to track down and research myself. So it would make life a little easier. Anyway. And frankly, as a dyslexic, I'm dependent on them, so I don't really care. Um, I just want the best I can get. So it's a fairly decent Dell. It's also something that has a friend of our, or the family's, after it was sort of broken, they went, I'm bored and I've got time on my hands. You haven't. Let me send it to me and fix it up. And he upgraded the solid, uh, the hard drive to a top of the range solid state drive, upgraded the graphics in it, uh, integrated gra the graphics system in it, and upgraded a few other things in it. So it's a fairly good laptop. Good luck, Thomas. <laughs> Why do I hear boss music? Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, the factory Strider. Oh, why do I have a feeling that's going to be what you want? That's what you're going to targeting next. That sounds like it. So it's a fairly good and yes. Please note though, one of the things we have promised her is once we move. She's going to get a brand new desktop for her office. <laughs> Run on. In a nice, in the simple terms, she watches the, tr the watches the lives, and she's on the Discord server. If she wants a pal, she'll track you down. <laughs> You'll get a message from someone who'll just go, So I hear you want to play Helldivers, you want a pal to play Helldivers with. When you free. <laughs> just remember, move, be prepared to move quickly. <laughs> Almost finished the Iron Brew. So, nice to hear everyone. If tw so, 12 16 half inch guns is a 66 to 72,000 or 73 to 84,000 ton hull too big. Um. I would say 84,000 ton hull is probably it if you're going for a full speed, if you want full speed, fully armoured battle cruiser approach with that sort of firepower. That was that patching. Mm. <laughs> Make sure we wouldn't turn it down. Okay. Okay. Also, yeah. <laughs> he's the he's bait respawn monkey. <laughs> Hello, I gave you 472. Yeah. <laughs> oh. oh, good lord. <laughs> Don't get me started. It, the nicest way I've told her, she'll, I'll build with whatever budget she gives me, I'll build her a computer. And, um, yeah. We'll see. Depends on how much we sell this place for. Because, basically, part, a, a, a chunk of the money from this place is going towards a new place. But also a chunk of his money from this place will hopefully go towards giving her um, a lot of free ca uh, some f cash in her reserves for retirement. Uh, for, well, for now she's she's sort of retired now. Sort of. She only does a couple of conversations and consultancies every now and again, um, and all those things. Yeah, she's fun. Her ma Actually, here's the thing. Is there a sword or axe available in Helldivers? Because she's... I think she's either heard there might be one or looking for one. We hope so, Melanie. No. Because they might add one. You see, she thinks really, and this was her phraseology. She 
she would uh, she feels she should go all um grimnar on them because she thinks that might be the best way to deal with some of the um tech uh, the 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 droids she feels having a suitable axe to whack their key points would take them out far quicker than the gun. That just that was the discussion. Look, our breakfast discussions when I'm supposed to be trying to make better breakfast is fun. Um, I, well, because you put oh, 75,000 tons of the iron limit, is that standard or full load displacement? A, that probably would standard, but also I'm not sure why you're saying that's a limit. Because the li only limit to the Royal Navy truly is the infrastructure. And if everyone else is building bigger, they'll build a bigger infrastructure. And because there's no point, you can't build, let's put it this way. In a world where everyone else is sending around 100,000 standard ton ships... And you've got a 75,000 ton ship. You have to make a decision whether you're enough 75, you have enough 75,000 sh ton ships to always outnumber them. Or whether one of your 75,000 ton ships can stand up to a 100,000 ton ship. Or whether you can't. Or, or whether you need to build the equivalent to it. And that's a scenario. Yeah, I think she's looking forward to the Illuminati. Um, but yeah, uh, the, the, look, realistically, what she really is looking forward to is the... Um, oh, what's it? Oh, this is going to require a Google search to look it up. Um, Yeah, she's looking forward to Space Marine 2. Um, that's another one of the games she likes. Goodness knows what she'll get up to on that one. She does like that. Uh, she likes that because she likes the range of weapons she's able to use. Hey. Matter, yeah, there's a whole... What do you mean manpower limit? You have options of increased automation in terms of systems and weapons. You also have the uh, thing of recruiting more people. You also have to consider the size of the Royal Navy in that period. And how many more personnel they have than today. So, yeah. One of the things you have to remember is the Geeds Axe and various other things to cut the Royal Navy in the 1920s and 30s. Because they want to, the government wants to spend the money on other things. And because the Navy has reduced budgets, so because the government wants to spend the money on other things. But if they're in a world where they've got to spend the money on the Navy, they're going to spend the money on the Navy. Do you imagine Space Marines 2 is going to be co-op? Yeah, I, I, I have... Yeah. She likes that. And I, I finished the Iron Brew. Thank you very much for the questions. I hope you enjoyed the answers, and I hope you found the video interesting. And, um, yeah, we've got about five minutes till about five hours. So I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to end the ch questions, the Q 
Q&A. But I'm going to keep going till about the five hour mark because I think I might as well complete it to five hours. So... That's the wrong button. That's the right one. Ending the Q&A in five, four, three, two, one. And um, I will. Uh, the interesting thing, you see, you see, she likes doing that. But one of the things, I, when I went in to sort out some food in the in sort of the break between the the Twitch stream and the live brew ships, I had uh, you know, I mentioned the fact that there's apparently the whole discussion of the female custodies. To my mom, she went, that could be fun. Uh, yeah. So yeah, not so much primaris, but custodies possibly she might want to do. Uh, you know, one of the advantages of automation of guns is it reduces the manpower, reduces the crew size. So that's one of the things driving that as a method, as a, s a scenario. And I honestly think in a scenario where you're building more and more, sh you're building more ships and you've got ongoing construction, I think you're more likely to get automation in. I know you mean a number of people. That's what I've been talking about. But you know there are there are three ways to approach that. One, you hire more people. Two, you you automate systems. Three, you do a set of all three of both, and plus, third one, you prepare to pay more. I can understand that, Duke of Petrion, but I can also say this. If you consider how selective they have to be to get the custodies and the roles they fill, the fact they're a full army capability, they are supposed to be a self-contained, they have their own fleets, all those things. Um, own sh uh, their own, uh, everything is included. Uh, you consider how small a percentage of the population could reach the level of being smart enough Mentally capable enough to become a custodies. I can understand why. And especially when you consider how the custodies really come out. Let's be honest. They are kind of the tradition of almost angels. They are, you know, basically... When I say angels, I mean that they are... Like, they have no life other than their work. They have no facility for life other than their work, really. They have... Uh, they have... Appreciation of art and education, yes, to discuss it, discuss things in the science and history, but everything's geared towards their work. They are genetically programmed super warriors. Um, it does make sense to me that to extent that you need um, uh, some re you need that you know some might be female. And if you consider, again, the number of agents and things who work for the custodies, the number of things, yes. I can see why it was the Sisters of Science, but again, uh, again to me, uh, it, it's like with the female Space Marines, okay? Originally, there were the first ever models produced of Space Marines included some female models. And one of my little cousins, um, she has collected a huge collection of those models. And she's decided that one of the missing uh, missing legions was the was made up of these female space marines, and that's what she's gone with. That that's perfectly acceptable within a law because originally they produced those models, so they're they're part of canon. They might not be, to be fair, the modern version of canon, but they are there. 
and it's a missing legion. One of the joys of the missing legions was they were there so that you could invent your entire own canon lore, and because they're written out of history, then that makes perfect sense of it. And also, it actually, because she did point out, and this was quite an interesting conversation I was having with her, was going, well, you see, here's the thing. If they believe, the warp might have changed one of them. And might have changed all them, uh, and so the Miami Marines might have been coming up. And one of the reasons why they reacted so the way they did to, let's say, them being sent on a mission or being killed is because it was their sister. And it was their only sister. It wasn't another brother who was killed, it was the sister. Or, or the, the one sister, uh, you know, of the family who was killed. And they're sort of thinking, oh... And that, that did actually put an, that put a whole interesting spin on the law for me. Admittedly, this is my little cousin who's like, he's now 13, I think. So frankly, in a nice way, I am very much indulgent uncle where she's con concerned. But yeah, it was a sort of interesting thing of, oh, well, actually, that would, ex that would explain why the brothers might have been quite so upset if one of them got killed. Because you imagine, if you're all brothers, maybe one brother goes mad. That's always been my thought about the one which is which is somewhere inside the palace. They went crazy over something, um, and the other one, you know, one loss was a sister, their only sister. Aren't the custodians re-engineered from birth? Pretty much. Or, you know, they're pretty much almost from the beginning. So, in a nice way, you can start with whatever you want in when you're re-engineering from that far. <laughs> Over five hours, yeah. Yeah. They're basically the custodies, and also if you consider some of the things the custodies do, they're, they're espionage. They are they are a one stop shop personal uh, personal force for the emperor to do all sorts of missions and all sorts of criteria. I can see the utility in having some who might be female. Your little sort of cousin. Well, you see, that was the thing. When she was presenting it to me, I was going, I've never thought about it like that, but yeah. I'd be far more annoyed if well, my only sister got killed. If I, you know, because it's going to sound strange, but that would be possibly one who'd be holding the whole group together. And, you know... It would be quite difficult. Well, a Primark who went mad is the, is the scenario I was thinking. And, yeah. And I mean absolutely frothing in a mouth. And the assassins are... There are lots of assassins who are female in the law. So, it, it's a thing. There are female super soldiers in the law already. Yeah, I... I, I, I do understand you but yeah still and after she died yeah that accelerated that that's one of the things which led to the Horus heresy it's a it's the, the reasoning she's come up with and I basically went well honestly that does have a logic to it I uh, you know, I know the rules, the rules about it, and the female space marines, etc. But there again, that would require, uh, you know, one could have changed, and yeah, to try and black it, uh, to try and completely dis make it disappear from history, to to complete information blackout. The emperor goes, there cannot be any female space marines. When actually, the reality is, to have a female space marine, you need to have a female prime, a, a, a female primarch, and there was only one. I agree, I don't want to see it shoehorned in or things just change for the fun. But as I said, this is my little cousin's thing, and so, uh, yeah. So, 
So, you know, they're united for one last revenge mission. Yes, because there was a pretty big war which pretty much every Primarch Legion was involved in. And that's kind of unusual for the Crusades. If I'm, if I'm memory, right? You know, so there was a very big war. And it's a case of... It's the sort of thing which ha would happen if you imagine if you were in the... If you were in sort of the, the, the Primarchs that were sort of around and your only sister gets taken out. The... Emperor probably didn't even have to issue orders. They're probably all heading there anyway. You know. Um, <laughs> your imposter are just messing me on Discord. Oh, cute. <laughs> yeah, I have an imposter on Discord now. They're not genetically model murder. They're stuck through bug games where they have to try and get to the throne room while not be murdered by their custodies. Again, it's not in, it, that's brains as much as brawn. In fact, more brains than anything else. Yeah. Sister gets taken out with her entire legion. Mm. Alright, Matador suggested to make them women. Big E shut that down. Uh, he did say they should have all been daughters, if I remember correctly. If I remember correctly, it was the phrase was all been daughters. Or daughters. That doesn't... Instead of sons. Well, that doesn't mean you haven't had a daughter. Rat to rat. And that's the thing. And that's why I said... Well, that my cousin made a point of one. And that's the difference. Because the rest are... There are sons. All the rest are sons. One daughter. Blood Games also helps... Yeah. Again, that makes it possible for uh, for someone who's female to get through in the blood games. But I thought the blood games were about people who already were custodies. And it would also, let's put it this way again. Look at the extreme measures they go to. They black, they completely mind warp, they mind wipe the Primarchs, so they do not remember it. They mind they they write them completely out of history. That's extreme methodologies. And, you know... The thing is, what happens to both of them? Does one... Does the... Uh, and here's the thing. What happens... And I said it goes mad, but... What happens if the other... If the remaining brother... The sister died trying to save him? The sister and her legion are wiped out trying to save him and he goes mad with guilt. And even the mind wipe doesn't work on that guilt because it's such a strong emotion. Because his only sister died trying to save him. And suddenly that's your entire reason for why he's locked up, he's locked up in being held prisoner. Because he's been driven so mad by that scenario. They can't do anything to do him. Gotta love the Amigo Dean Law. It's all canon, just not all of it's true. Was uh, was Game Workshop's excuse? Well, that's the, the scenario, true scenario about the the forty k and how complicated it is. But as I said, it was my, my little cousin's idea, and it really did impress me. And it's why, sort of, yeah, when pe whenever someone's been rude, uh, been rude when she's tried to turn up for a game with her all f female legion, I'd basically just go, no. I I swear, if she wanted, uh, even if she didn't have good law, I'd still you know, tell them to know and go away. But as it is, she has this. It doesn't work in the sort of the 40k setting. It works in the... A lot of something. Makador suggested maid, so a single daughter might not have been initiated, but due to warp shenanigans. Yeah. There's all sorts of things you could theorize but with, uh, with with Warhammer 40k, but yeah. It would also... If you remember correctly, the Emperor has a way to bring them back. Uh, that was discussed about the Ferris. He really had to fix that problem at some point. He su supposedly can rebuild his Primarchs. Well, that could have also been the other issue. He might not have been able to rebuild 
that Primark because, as you said, you might be warped shenanigans. Oh, I, think I went to go to the pub and came back and you're still alive. Yeah, we're talking about Warhammer 40k. I, I should finish, but, you know, <laughs> I'm enjoying the chat. Oh. See, what are the super chats I received today? Oh, the, the, the fan funding, what's it called? Did I answer all those questions? Yes, I did. Thank you to everyone who did the Iron Brew Fund, etc. Oh. I was making sure I didn't miss any of them. Uh, you could actually get those back because the Primaris are spawned from the OG notes and Gene Seed of all 20 Primarchs. Well, that would be the interesting thing. And that's where your female Space Marines could come in, theoretically. If this re if there really was a female a a female prime a female Primarch and that was the missing sister, that could be the really interesting thing, which Crawl, or Crawl could go, you do realise some of our um, Space Marines, they have uh, mutated very strangely. And the Proto one, of course, did go... Well, the Proto one, he's not really a Primarch, is he? It, it, it made it, 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 it... Basically, the Emperor had to do things because the levels were set too high. He tried to put too much of himself in one vessel. The Angel, yes. Duke of Etchen, I know what you're talking about, but that's trouble is... He tried to make it did disappear, but the question is, did it disappear with the emperor's? Did the angel's body disappear and storage disappear with the with the emperor's knowledge, and disappeared by the custodies, or was it disappeared by anyone other others? The angel's really the proto primarch. It's a test bed of a lot of the stuff which goes into the primarchs. Um. There's heavy... In nicest way, there's also... There's things like the... Um, what are they called? Begin with an M. Uh, the, the group which turn up over Earth while there's attempted rebellion against Gilliman going on. They're um, really massive. And there's rumours they have Thunder Warrior in them. Oh, uh, Brain Minotaurs. The Minotaurs, um, you know, they, they, they could have Thunder Warrior in them. There's a, a sort of unaided idea about that. Or that their uh, actual, their um, leader is an actual Thunder Warrior. Cool, Railway, uh, railway Thinker. My, war, my army is currently transitioning to Iron Wolves. Oh. In the nicest way, um, that would be a good thing to really drive them mad if the Trezen had nicked the female pri uh, female Primarch, and um, they would that would uh, they would have gone to war to try and get him back, and if they couldn't, that would be so frustrating. That would actually could be a reason. Oh, good lord, that could actually be it. Huge battle, which is wiping out a legion, it gets taken by Trazen. They realise she they she has been taken by Trazen, and they can't get her back from Trazen. Although, frankly, no. In that scenario, that would tee up a whole battle between Traz uh, between Trazen and the Emperor, in Warhammer Thirty K era, um, and that would have been an interesting battle. Because let's be honest, there's no way if... And Trazen, though, has got Fulgrim. Um... Well, 
Well, that, that, that the only funny thing would be, of course, all the brothers joking that the um, female Primarch is better than is is um, less. Well, actually, no. The joke would be if. The female Primarch is the counterpart because if you consider all the all the um, all the Primarchs are in a way balanced, and what would be really funny is if the pr female Primarch came from I don't know a cat world, a big cat world, kind of like um, what's the name? Oh, good lord! I've forgotten it. Uh, I've forgotten it. Um, you know, sort of is the counterpart to, um, brain is dying on me. Lehman Russ. So basically, if that it turned out that the counterpart to the one who balanced Lehman Russ was this female Primark who was I don't know had big cats rather than big uh, rather than wolves. <laughs> Lehman Russ, yeah. And <laughs> Lehman Russ, and just the things. To be honest. Space Marine Legions don't take death from Primark. Well, no, they don't. I'm building, and uh, my my forces are going to be Iron Wolves. The gene seed was collected before. But it depends. They were already warp infused before they were scattered by the warp, weren't they? New IQB 4472. And that's the thing, it might be the warp infusion. Well, I wouldn't necessarily say Lionel Johnson is, is the one who balanced Russ. I always think Lionel Johnson balances the Alpha, Alpha and Omegon. I think that's who balances the Alpha and Omegon. Because it's the similar approaches to secrecy, etc. Um, I don't know. I don't think so, Runon, mainly because of the way their mentality is structured with Primarchs. Um, it's going to sound strange. They are, they are both incredibly complex and very simple. Uh, they don't feel emotions the same way. Humans do, and I, I, it's only from my own reading and I know something, and I could be completely wrong, but I see gender dysphoria as something which connects far more of emotions. Um, I know that not all Gilliman, but they, uh, they process emotions in a very different way. Hmm. Take care, Leslie. Cronks. Oh, Cronks would be fun. Corox crosses the Corox balances the curves. Round threats. First use of secrets as a shield, whilst twenty fuses secrets as weapons. In which case they're each other's foil. Shield to the sword. Uh, they, they, that's sort of what they do. They tend to balance each out. It's an interesting thing. It's an interesting train of thought to go down. I have to admit. It is an interesting scenario to think about. But I have now realised it is now five, and a half, five hours and twenty minutes long, this live. So we'll call it finished. Um...
No, Duke Machine, I think the Alpha Legion ha hate the Raven's Guard for other reasons other than them being the counter to them. I, I think there's more to it than just that, and I don't think I don't think necessarily the hatred doesn't go directly across between the, the counters. Um, cause Urxico Dawn Purdy Gunman World Bear uh, World Be uh, <clears throat> World Bearers, yeah Russ, yeah, that's the thing, cats and dogs, and um, yeah. I just, that just, that's actually, to be fair, where my cousin's gone, because she's gone with, she's looked at them and gone, well, none of them got big cat-inspired formations, really. I went, well, there's the lion. She went, yeah, but that doesn't really count. He's called the lion, but he's not really interested in big cats. Conrad is counted by Conrad because he ends himself. That is to an extent it. Space wolves, space tiger, uh, you know, if you consider it's the lunar wolves, it's the space wolves... All sorts of things. Um, there's no space tigers. I don't know. Night 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 security for one. Night night John Shea. Night night GV40. Night night everyone. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Uh, it's uh, interesting. It's an interesting thing. <laughs> yeah. Now, if Warhammer 40k actually end up producing or, admit, or saying that there was a cat girl Primark. I want my little cousin to get the credit for it, and I will fight them for that. <laughs> Man in Sydney 40. Night. Uh, not in law, not a legal battle, because I don't want to deal with lawyers again. I will. It will be a war. It will, they can bring their best army versus my family's best army. Combined. We'll see who has the larger army. <laughs> Oi, caramba. Take care, Ron. Iron Wolves, Iron Warriors, or Space Wolves. Iron Wolves are what I'm building now. Space Mountain Lions. Space Panthers. Scary and slinky. There's the Celestial Lions, which are Ro one, of, one of Rogue and Dawn selectors, uh, Rogue and Dawn's um, successors. And the Lion Warriors, who are an unknown um, if Codex Astartes compliance based of unknown origin and founding. Um, the chapter is not really well known in Imperial Records. And, yeah. Gene Seed for Primarchs was like the post finding Primarchs. Take care, Aaron. Take care. Thank you, Adrian Ford. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Tigers Argent. <laughs> oh. Renon, lions tend to be more knightly or heroic lions than thematically. So, yeah. Yeah, panthers. Snow leopards or snow tiger or, 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 or you know or Siberian tiger sort of themed, yeah. I, 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 the more and more I'm thinking about this, the more and more I think my little cousin's right. I'm just gonna just leave it at that. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care and thank you for watching. <laughs>